You may be seated. Right. Do you need to approach for a moment? Okay. Your next question, Mr. Banya. Um, before lunch, we were talking about your opinions in response to the testimony of Mr. Schnell. Did you also um, analyze the testimony of Ms. Arnold in this case? Yes, I did. And are you aware of her opinion that Ms. Hurd's career would have followed the same trajectory as that of Jason Momoa, Gal Gadot, Zendaya, Anna de Armas, and Chris Pine, if not for the Waldman statements? Yes. What's your understanding of Ms. Arnold's basis um, for her opinion that Ms. Hurd's career should have been similar to that of those identified actors? Um, Ms. Arnold uh, stated that when producers or her industry is looking to uh, hire uh, talent and actors, that it's important to best understand the, the public's perception of um, the actors that they're considering. Uh, and that it's important to you know, look into social media uh, to see what what is happening with uh, the actors they're considering for either a movie or even a uh, an endorsement opportunity with companies. Um, so that that was her approach. And is that the process she followed in providing her analysis of those purportedly comparable actors? No. Although she stated that, she went in and uh, brought in these comparable, uh, alleged comparable actors and um, without really the reasoning behind that. Did you conduct an analysis based on your expertise in social media and internet analytics of Ms. Hurd compared to the actors to whom Ms. Arnold um, compares her? I did. And what did you find? Well, since uh, Ms. Arnold stated that the proper approach is looking at the public perspective, looking into social media, uh, and, and she did not do that, I felt that was the best approach to do this based on her, her words. So, yes, I did go into, uh, you know, best understanding the public perspective of um, Ms. Hurd and the alleged comparable actors using Q scores, and then I also went and did some analysis on, online and on social media as well. Can you briefly remind the jury what Q scores are? Yeah, again, Q scores uh, measure uh, how well a celebrity, it could be a, a cartoon character, it could be a sports person, how well they're known, how well they're liked, and how much they're disliked. And it's, it's an industry standard tool that's used. Uh, it's not just focused on the movies that they're in, but it's the, uh, focused on them as actors but also uh, what's happening in their personal lives uh, come to play as well. Uh, so that's how Q-scores are typically used. Did you prepare a demonstrative that reflects the Q-score analysis you completed? Yes, I did. Okay. Your Honor, may I approach again? All right, thank you. No objection to the demonstrative. All right, we'll identify plaintiffs 1296 um, for identification and publish to the jury.
Mr. Banya, what, what point in time do these Q-scores represent that are reflected on your demonstrative? So this, uh, these are the winter 2019 Q-scores um, that are reflected here. And what was important for me is I, I wanted to find Q-scores uh, that represented Miss Heard after Aquaman. And, and remember, Aquaman is December of 2018. These Q scores were gathered January and February of 19, but before the Waldman statements. And what did you find based on the Q scores that you looked at? So as you see here on the left uh, are positive Q scores, and, and you know, the higher the number, the better. Uh, as you can see, uh, you know, Ms. Godot uh, has the highest Q score out of the, out of the group of uh, actors here uh, at a 28. Uh, but you're going to notice Ms. Hurd uh, has the lowest positive Q score. Uh, she has a 9. Uh, so I find that um, very interesting that uh, she doesn't appear to fit in as a comparable with these alleged comparable actors. Um, I think what's also interesting is the average Q score for all actors being scored at that time, which include uh, all the alleged comparable actors here, score uh, at an average of 17. And you can see, again, she is nine well below that. And then on the right side, you're going to see the negative Q scores. So this is uh, how much people dislike you. Um, you know, so the lower the score is better. Uh, you can see Mr. Momo is over here with the lowest at an eight, but you can see Miss Hurd is over here at a 28, which is was quite a difference, uh, you know, a 20 point difference from Mr. Momoa, uh, and also a 10 point difference, uh, you know, from the average of all actors. So she is very, very much a little. Uh, her positive score is very low, and her negative score is is very high, uh, which tells me that she does not fit in as a comparable as it relates to these alleged comparable actors. Um, what opinions did you form based on that Q-score analysis? Uh, my opinions as it relates to these Q-scores is, um, you know, uh, Miss Arnold used uh, these uh, actors as allegedly comparable actors. Um, but really, listening to her testimony yesterday, it appears that she's abandoned this approach. I don't think she's using these comparable actors or these alleged comparable actors anymore. She's more relying on her um, experience, and I agree with that. Did Ms. Arnold offer a criticism of your use of the Q scores here? She did, yes. And what's your understanding of what that criticism is? Well, what I believe she was saying is that I should have ran Q scores for these allegedly comparable actors after each of their breakout films, which um, I disagree. First of all, Q scores doesn't work like that. Q scores are available twice a year. So it's not that I could pick a month or a different month for each of, of, of Q score um, actors. Um, so I feel that, you know, what was important for me, and this doesn't always happen when, when I'm using Q scores, you can get this per perfect moment in time, as Miss Hurd said, I'm sorry, but as Miss Arnold said, that, you know, Aquaman was Miss Hurd's breakout moment. You know, so these scores reflect that, that breakout moment, uh, and, and, and they're terrible Q scores. How would your analysis change if you had used um, Ms. Arnold's logic with respect to the, to the timing of the Q scores that you looked at? I mean, if you really think about what uh, Ms. Arnold was saying, is she's saying that she thinks Q scores are the highest for each actor right after their breakout moment. So I would think, if anything, uh, these Q scores could have been a bit lower. Uh, because it's not right after their breakout moment. But what again, what's important for me is the fact that these scores reflect, you know, who Amber Heard was at the time before the Waldman statements, but after the Aquaman release. Um, we can take that one down, Tom. Thank you. What other work have you done um, in connection with forming your opinions in this case? Um, again, taking the advice from Ms. Arnold, it's important. Uh, she says the industry looks into social media, uh, what their followings are like, uh, you know, with the numbers as it relates to their followers. Um, you know, again, what is the public perception of them? So I, I analyzed uh, 
their social media accounts, um, but prior to the the Waldman statement. So, and how how did you do that? Yeah. So what I did, I don't know if you're all familiar with the archive.org. Uh, they have a tool called the Wayback Machine. What archive.org does is it it archives the internet. So you can go back in time to see what websites and web pages used to look like uh, in the past. Uh, not all the time can you actually get a celebrity's social media accounts to have been archived, but uh, we were fortunate that each of the alleged comparable actors' social media accounts were in um, archive.org. So I was able to go back in time prior to the Waldman statements to see what, what the following activity was for each of the alleged comparable actors. Mr. Banya, did you prepare a demonstrative um, that def reflects your social media analysis? Yes. Your Honor, may I approach? Yes, ma'am. No objection to the demonstrative. All right, we'll mark it for identification purposes, plaintiffs 1297 and publish. Mr. Bynum, could you tell the jury what you found when you looked at the social media? Yeah, so what I found, again, this is prior to the Waldman statements. You know, first thing you're going to notice here is not all actors use social media. You're going to see Mr. Pine uh, doesn't have Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram and Momo and Darmus don't use Facebook or Twitter. Uh, but what's important to look at is um, you have misheard prior to the Waldman statements with 3.8 um, Instagram followers and 142,500 uh, Twitter followers. And then you, you, you move down to uh, Gal Gadot uh, with 37 million Instagram followers compared to 3.8 million. Uh, and, you know, uh, 2 million, 2.3 million uh, Twitter followers compared to Ms. Hurd's 142,000. And you can then even go down to Zendaya with 65 point, uh, million, point 0.9 and 17.2 million uh, Twitter followers. What this is telling me is really, you know, more people are interested in Ms. Godot and Zendaya and even uh, Mr. Momoa uh, than Ms. Hurd on social media. It, it just tells me a lot of people are interested in these uh, actors as opposed to Ms. Heard, more of a following. Q scores, well-liked, less disliked. So it kind of fits into the analysis of determining whether or not these alleged comparable actors are actually comparable. Based on your expertise, what are your overall opinions about uh, Ms. Arnold's analysis of the so-called comparable actors? Yes, again, you know, it appears that she's abandoned this approach, but, and I agree with that. I, I feel that you know, through the Q-score analysis and the uh, uh, social media analysis that they're just not comparable. <clears throat> Tom, we can take that one down. Mr. Banya, based on um, all the analysis you did in this case, what, what are your overall opinions? Yes, my overall opinions are that uh, Mr. Schnell failed to prove any causal connection with the Waldman statements and the uh, uh, search or the uh, hashtag activity, those spikes as it relates to Twitter. There, there, there's no causal connection there. Um, my second opinion is, you know, based on my uh, social media and Q-score analysis, uh, Ms. Arnold's comparable, alleged comparable actors are not comparable. And then third, uh, Ms. Arnold and Mr. Schnell both failed to prove any causation as it relates to the Waldman statements causing economic harm to Ms. Heard. So, you know, as a damages expert, which um, uh, Ms. Arnold is, uh, you, you need to take into consideration causation before you can calculate damages. You look at damages and you look at this allegedly damaging event and not only do you have to prove that 100% of the damage is because of these Waldman statements, she didn't even consider uh, COVID. It happened at the same time. You know, a lot of actors probably made a lot less money because of COVID. Maybe films didn't get made. And, you know, when you do, do an analysis of, of damages, you prove causation, but you also have to look at everything else that might have caused this alleged 
economic harm. And she didn't look into any of that. She didn't even know what causation was. So I don't think a damages is an appropriate approach in this case. No further questions, Your Honor. All right, cross-examination. Good afternoon, Mr. Banyan. Hi. Yeah, you're not a damages expert, correct? I am a damages expert, but not providing any quantitative damages uh, opinions in this case. In this case, okay. And is it your testimony that only if a person repeats the Waldman depth statements could they be related to the defamation? Say that one more time. Are you saying that a person literally has to repeat the Waldman depth statements in a, tw in a tweet for them to be related to the defamation? Uh, no, if you looked at my analysis, I did pick the three themes as it relates to the tweets and I uh, analyzed those themes and I came up with five examples of when th those themes were used. And you ran searches for, quote, abuse hoax, sexual violence hoax, and fake sexual violence. And you ran all those in quotes, correct? I did. So only if a person used a tweet with those words in that order and with that spacing would they hit on your searches, correct? Objection, compound, overruled. Yeah, so I used them in quotes because, you know, the could, hoax could be used in many other contexts. So I wanted to make sure I was fitting my search with the theme of the Waldman statements. So if someone tweeted misheard faked sexual violence, that wouldn't appear in your, that wouldn't appear in your searches, correct? Faked with an ED. Uh, it would not. And, any, and if they use two spaces between abuse and hoax, that wouldn't fit in your search. That's correct. Okay. <clears throat> Did you, and a, tweet's 200 and a tweet can only be 280 characters, correct? That's correct. All right. So certain of the Waldman Depp uh, statements, a person could not tweet the whole thing in one tweet, correct? The whole statement in one tweet. The Waldman statements? Correct. Um, no, you, you could not uh, okay. tweet that into those entire quotes. Did you make any determination if there was an online bullying campaign against Mr. Depp after Ms. Hurd's op-ed? I didn't look into any uh, online bullying campaign for Ms. Hurd nor Ms. Mr. Depp. Did you determine if there were tweets harassing Mr. Depp that quoted from Ms. Hurd's op-ed? No, my assignment was to determine if the Waldman statements were part of the, the, the tweets that Mr. Schnell provided. I was, I was rebutting him. And in your analysis of when you, when you testified before, you never looked to see if the op-ed was quoted anywhere, correct? Objection, Your Honor. May we approach? <laughs> All right, questions withdrawn. Next question. Um, now, you have no objection to Ms. Arnold's use of comparables, correct? Just the use of comparables in general. I listened to her testimony in my understanding that she abandoned that, uh, uh, that approach. But as it relates to my testimony today, uh, my opinion was related to those specific alleged comparable actors that they were not comparable. You're not offering an opinion as to who the appropriate comparables should be to Ms. Hurt, correct? Correct. Okay. And um, you you testified just before about the Q scores of Ms. Hurd and the and the comparables. That was uh, plaintiff's exhibit twelve ninety six, correct? I don't know what uh, twelve ninety six means. Okay. The, the, the demonstrative in front of you. Mine? Yes, that's correct. Um, and you said that those were all for the winter of 2019? I said Ms. Hurd's were from the winter of 2019. Because isn't it true that none of the rest of these people were from the winter of 2019, correct? That's correct. Okay. In fact, uh, Mr. Momoa's was from the summer of, tw of 2020. Of 2020? That's correct. Not all alleged comparable actors had Q scores for that date. What was important for me is to get Ms. Hurd's Q scores right after Aquaman, but before the Waldman statements. So you weren't comparing apples to apples, correct? 
I wouldn't say that. I'm saying that it's not the exact same years. Well, so in the winter of 2019, that Q score comes out that the field date, the field work dates for that is from January 22nd, 2019 to February 7th, 2019, correct? That is correct. So that would be start. So the field work would be starting almost Im immediately after Aquaman just came out, correct? Yeah, and her star is born moment, yes. You'd agree that for the winter of 2020, where you took Jason Momoa's Q score, would have more time to account for the rise in popularity of the film Aquaman, correct? Well, actually, if I use Ms. Arnold's suggestion, uh, the, the celebrities tend to have, you know, the, the, the celebrity moment right after they have their breakout film. So uh, I disagree with that. I think maybe his Q scores could be lower as it relates to when I use them. You'd agree that for the winter of 2020, Mr. Momoa's Q score would have more time to account for the rise in popularity of the film Aquaman. I don't know if it accounts for the rise of popularity. Again, using Ms. Arnold's uh, words, uh, usually a Q score will be the, the highest after, right after the film, like I did measure Ms. Hurd. May I have first round? All right. Do you show? Thank you. If you if you look on page one seventy seven of your deposition transcript, you see that? I don't see a page, is that what you handed me? You don't see page one seventy seven? Um, I thought it's four pages. Four pages per. Oh yes, thank you. And I asked you at lines six through ten, you'd agree that for the winter of 2020, Jason Momoa's Q score would have more time to account for the rise of popularity in the film Aquaman, and you answered yes. Uh, at that time, as I am a rebuttal expert to Ms. Arnold, based on her testimony, I've learned something new from her. You did, and you didn't look at Ms. Hurd's Q score for summer of 2020, correct? She doesn't have any. And Ms. DeArmas had a lower lower familiarity score than Ms. Hurd, correct? Um, if I don't have that in front of me, but if you're saying that, yes. Okay. And Ms. DeArmas' tra career tra trajectory has gone up since the summer of 2020, correct? I, I don't know. I didn't analyze her career trajectory. Okay. Um... Could we, could you put up plan, uh, trial exhibit 1297? That was the demonstrative. Ms. DeArmas has less Instagram followers than Ms. Hurd, correct? Correct. And by, Ms. Hurd has more than double the Instagram followers of Ms. DeArmas, correct? Yes. Okay. And isn't it true that you get more social media followers the longer you're on social media? Uh, not necessarily. It, it doesn't work that way. It, it depends on many other factors. And, and so Mr. Armis had a lower familiarity score and less Instagram followers, yet your testimony is that she would not be a proper comparable to Ms. Hurd? That's correct. Okay. And you're not offering a different set of people who should be comparables, correct? That's correct. Okay, you, thank you. you can take that down. Now, you understand that Mr. Waldman has been banned from Twitter for life for harassing Amber Heard, correct? I, I don't know that, uh, but if that's the case. And you understand that Mr. Waldman appealed the decision to Twitter and they have confirmed his ban for life? Objection, Your Honor. May we approach on this one? Okay, sure.
agree that in looking at Mr. Schnell's data, 65% of the uses of negative hashtags relating to Ms. Heard occurred between April 1st, 2020 and June 15th, 2021, correct? Correct. Okay. And you would agree that five of the six highest spikes of the negative hashtags were after the Deb Waldman statements, correct? Correct. Okay. And where you talked about the February 2020 spike, and the 65%, by the way, even includes the February 2020 spike of tweets, correct? That's correct. But, well, there was no spike in Feb 2020 during the Waldman statements. Well, the, Feb, the spike in February 2020 was before the Waldman statements, right? I would have you. Can we pull up the chart again if you want to talk about the spikes? Sure. Can you put up 1294? Number one. Number one. Yeah, that spike happened before the Waldman statements. Okay. And there was hardly any activity in negative hashtags until February 2020, correct? That's correct. And you understand that the spike in February 2020 was related to the partial tape that Mr. Waldman and Mr. Depp leaked to the Daily Mail, right? I'm aware that the articles were related to um, Heard admitting to hitting Depp. And you understand that Mr. Waldman testified that Mr. Depp and Mr. Waldman met with the Daily Mail in person to provide the partial tape to the Daily Mail. Objection, Your Honor. Okay, she's talking about, he talked about what's, what the number one related what, what, to. What's the objection? Sorry, lack of foundation. And... I'm, asking, I'm asking if he knows, if he knows or he doesn't. All right, I'll, we'll rule. So what's important to me is the fact that this spike is I, prior I, to the sir, Waldman sir, statements. Uh, do you know if this? Do you know if Mr. Waldman testified that Mr. Depp and he met with the Daily Mail in person to provide the partial tape? No. In February of 2020, you don't know one way or the it's other. It's irrelevant to my opinion. Okay. And the spike in July of 2020 came right after the last defamatory statement by Mr. Depp and Mr. Waldman, correct? Uh, the July spike, which is number two, uh, is not related to the Walden statements, and it, uh, there are articles related to abuse between Heard and Depp and feces found in Depp's bed. And that's based on Google searches you did? That's correct. Okay. And the July, but the July spike in time came after the June 27th, 2020 defamatory statement by Mr. Depp and Mr. Walden, correct? That's correct. Okay. And... As, and five of the six spikes came after the defamatory statements, correct? After the Waldman statements, yes. Okay. Now, you testified before that you eliminated shares and likes of the Depp Waldman statements from your analysis, right? <sighs> Repeat that, please. Did you say that you eliminated shares and likes of tweets that included the Depp Waldman statements? That's correct. When I was doing my analysis, I noticed the exact same text was a part of many of these tweets. Don't, don't shares and likes disseminate the negative information? That's quite possible. Okay. And you agree, right, that use of the term Waldman or Waldminion occurred over 25% of the time in the negative tweets toward Ms. Heard from April 2020 through January 2021, correct? Although it's irrelevant to this case, it has nothing to do with the Waldman statements. That's what Mr. Schnell says. You don't disagree with his, you don't disagree with the search results, correct? Yeah, although it has nothing to do with this case or the Waldman statements, I do not disagree. So if people are tweeting about Adam Waldman and, or Waldminion at the same time as tweeting negative hashtags hashtags about Amber Heard, that has, it's your testimony that they have nothing to do with this case? The hashtags have nothing to do with this case. It, that's, that's what you're saying? Okay. Uh, what, yeah. Okay. And even if they include the negative hashtags with Wal, Mr. Waldman's name and Waldminion, you're saying they have nothing to do with the defamatory statements? All four hashtags that Snell used had nothing to do with the Waldman statements. I, yeah. Waldman himself has nothing to do with the Waldman statements. We're talking about the Waldman statements here. Waldminion, 
I don't even know what that is, but again, it has nothing to do with this case, and it's not related to the, the Waldman statements. That's and, what's and, important. And the reason you're saying they're not related to the Waldman statements is because someone didn't literally copy what Adam Waldman said in the Daily Mail and tweet it out? Well, I looked at, at enough tweets that included the name Waldman that have nothing to do with anything negative or the Waldman statements. No, they must, I have, mean, had Mr. They must Wal have had to have the negative hashtags toward Ms. Heard because the only way that those would have been in the data you looked at would have had the negative hashtags towards Ms. Heard. It, he wasn't look, he, it was looking at that universe, correct? Well, first of all, I don't agree that the, the justice for Johnny Depp is a negative hashtag towards Amber Heard. So, listen, the assignment was to determine if the tweets that Mr. Schnell presented were related or included the Waldman statements. In your review of the tweets related to Ms. Heard, you cannot point to any that were positive toward Ms. Heard, correct? Again, I was not looking for that. And you did not review the hashtag Johnny, Justice for Johnny Depp during the time frame from April 1st, 2020 to January 1st, 2020 to see if there were any that were not negative toward Ms. Heard? I did not look into anything as it relates to anything other than what relates to the Waldman statements. That's what's at issue here today as we sit in court. Okay. And you didn't form any statistical analysis to rule out the Waldman statements impact on the hashtags, correct? Correct. You did not analyze whether media and press coverage other than the Waldman statements affected Ms. Hurd's career, correct? Correct. Okay. Looking at um, the exhibit in, that's in front of you, where you have the numbers here, those you said are related to Google, Google searches? Uh, the one through six? Correct. Yes. Okay. And can we put up um, plaintiff's 888? And we could just start at one. Do you understand that your Oh, thanks. And 888, it's page 76. These are the documents you relied upon for your opinion today? Yes. And are these the search, the, where it has the different letters, these are the searches uh, that you ran for the various time frames and the articles that came up for numbers one through six, correct? No, I mean, obviously document 1A is the Heard Supplemental Expert Witness Disclosure. These are, these are documents that I used throughout the time I've been working on this project. So not, these aren't related to those one through six numbers. Okay, these are documents you relied upon for your opinion today? These are documents that I relied upon when I presented my, my designation. The, the, for, your opinion, for your opinion today, that you're offering today? Yeah, these are the documents that, yes, I've relied on throughout this entire, this case. Okay. And actually, Michelle, could you turn in this designation to um, let's see uh, hold on one second. Go, can you just scroll down? Yeah, I keep scrolling. Let's keep going. Keep going. Okay, stop. This was the chart you provided with your designation for your opinions in this case, correct? Yes. Okay. And it's it's similar to the chart that we had before that we had before with the one through six, correct? That's correct. And where it has the various boxes, it's talking about documents six E through six H, for instance, related to Depp wanting to have Heard replaced on Aquaman. You yes. And you you prepared this chart, correct? Yeah, this was part of my designation. I'd like to have this page um, as a demonstrative. Your Honor, I do have an objection, if I might be heard. All right, if you want to come forward, page 99.
Mr. Banya. Um, other than uh, so as I understand it your the way you determined that the tweets were not related to the Waldman statements was that you looked at time and then you ran certain Google searches correct correct and then the top three hits came up. Correct. And you were, and then you looked through the article to see if the Waldman statements were there. So, as it relates to any trending event, any a defamation that's happened online, any allegations of, of of economic loss because something went viral, going to Google, looking at the spikes in time and going back in time to see what was happening on those top three sites will give you an indication of, of the best results that were being served at that time. So something viral that's happening would appear most likely in those top three results. And just so the record's clear, if we could put, go back to page 76 of this document. Numbers 6A through 6N going to the next page. Those are the those are the headlines of the searches that you found. Correct. Okay. And you, you don't disagree that the ne that negative tweets toward Miss Heard have continued throughout your throughout the analysis of the tweets. Correct. I'm not looking at whether they're negative tweets or those hashtags are negative. I'm determining if those tweets are related to the Waldman statements. Right, okay, and you and you haven't. You, there's no. You have no. So you have no opinion whether the tweets were ne positive or negative towards Ms. Heard. That's what. That's what you're saying. Yes, I'm just analyzing whether or not they're related okay. to the Waldman statements. Okay. Thank you. Nothing further. All right. Redirect. I have no further questions of this witness, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Banya. Yes. Thank you. Sorry. Do not discuss the case and don't do any outside research. Sorry. We'll just take a short break. All right. So just so that we're on the same page. You can have a seat. <laughs> Keep standing the whole time. All right, just so we're on the same page with Mr. Knight's testimony. Actually, could Mr. Knight go back out, please? All right, all right. So we're on the same page with Mr. Knight's testimony. Um, there is a rule on witnesses. However, Mr. Knight's a rebuttal witness. Um, the purpose of excluding witnesses uh, from the courtroom, usually it's a courtroom, is to deprive a, a, a later witness of the opportunity to shape testimony to correspond with that of an earlier witness. Um, the issue we have here, obviously, if it was a direct witness in the direct testimony, you had time to do a rule on witnesses, let them know about the rule on witnesses. With a rebuttal witness, it's a little different because um, they didn't know they were going to be a witness. You didn't know they were going to be a witness. I understand that part. The problem is the courtroom in this particular case appears to be the world. So what we have to do here is um, I'm going to do a voir dire, and I'll let, allow both sides to ask questions as well, of Mr. Knight to see what he has seen of the case. And I'm just going to use the factors um, that the case law in Virginia uses, which uh, the factors to consider, because the court does have broad discretion to permit or prohibit a witness um, to testify in this particular circumstance. So the factors I'm going to consider is if the impropriety was intentional, which we'll find out, uh, the prejudice attached to it, 
also if the excluded witness learned about substantive aspects of the case from an earlier testifying witness and whether that knowledge had any effect on his or her testimony. So those are the three factors I'm going to look at in weighing this decision. Um, so keep that in mind when you do your voir dire. And it's my understanding that the evidence that Mr. Knight will testify only relates to Hicksville. Is that correct? Okay. All right. Now we can have Mr. Knight. Come on. All right, sir, Mr. Knight, if you could come forward to be sworn. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to testify truthfully in this case in the penalty of law? I do. All right, sir, if you could just have a seat, please. Right, sir, I'm, what's, what we're doing is I'm just going to ask you a few questions outside the presence of the jury, and then the attorneys are going to ask you a few questions, okay? Sure. And then I'm going to have you step back outside after that, okay? No problem. All right, what's your full name, sir? Uh, Morgan Higby Knight. Okay, you don't have to be that close. All right. All right, how do you spell your last name? N-I-G-H-T. Okay. All right, and sir, um, before I can allow you to testify, I just want to ask you a few questions. Um, have you seen any of the trial that's been going on for the past six weeks? Um, approximately five weeks ago, a friend of mine texted me that Hicksville was mentioned and I watched a little clip where okay. it was mentioned. Which clip did you watch? Um, I believe it was, uh, somebody testifying about, I think it was the security guard testifying maybe about Hicksville or, um, I forget exactly who was testifying but it was something where Hicksville was mentioned and uh, it was uh, about something about a wrist or something like that. All right, and what did you do after that? Did, at some point did you get in contact with attorneys? So I didn't reach out to them. Um, I didn't really care. The, okay. uh, the innkeepers that worked at Hicksville before reached out to them and said, we saw some stuff that wasn't true and then they asked, is it okay if I give the attorneys your phone number? So the attorneys reached out to me. Okay, and when did the attorneys reach out to you? May 3rd. May 3rd, and yeah. you talked to the attorneys at that time? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Not Camille, but um, Gerilyn. Okay, and then have you seen any other parts of the trial? No, she instructed me not to watch anything about it, regardless no. of if it was about Higgsville or not. So I haven't, I've been Since keeping off, off the internet and turning off uh, anything that seems to be like it's on social media, so I just don't watch any of that. Okay. All right. And questions, Ms. Yes, Breder? So, Mr. Knight, you were contacted by an attorney for Mr. Depp on May 3rd? Yes. Okay. And you said it was Carolyn? Gerilyn. Gerilyn. Oh, Gerilyn. I got it. Okay. And... What? I think it's pronounced Gerilyn. Okay, can you tell us the conversation you had with her at that time? Yeah, she um, just asked me my recollection of the evening, and I told her, and she said, okay, um, would you mind testifying? And I said, sure. And she said, uh, okay, well then, we're not sure if we're going to call you or not, but just in case, please don't watch anything having to do with the case. And I said, I will do. Um, now, how is it that, to your best knowledge, how is it that Gerilyn was able to get hold of you? How did, how did she know that you knew something? So, like I said, two of my innkeepers, my innkeeper and my manager, had reached out to her team, um, I think through email, and one of them uh, texted me and said, hey, do you mind if we give her? Gerilyn, your phone number. Now, you also communicated uh, on Twitter, did you not, about this case? Yeah, two weeks prior to Gerilyn reaching out to me, um, someone had made a comment about something that happened by the fire pit, and I said, that's not my recollection. I didn't see, that's not, that's not what I saw. So who was it that made a comment about something that happened at the fire pit? 
So once um, I was told about uh, the fact that Higgsville was mentioned, I went and did a Twitter search of Higgsville trailer. So it was, I don't know who it was, but I was just like, what are they saying about Higgsville? And so that was um, why I did a search just to see, cause it was weird and fascinating cause the night to me um, wasn't that remarkable in the context of all the different experiences I've had at the trailer palace. So explain to me, please, what you mean by you did a trailer search. So if you go to Twitter and you put in keywords and do a search, all the um, tweets regarding that subject come up or anything with those keywords in it. So that is how I found the tweet that I replied to. Okay. And how many tweets did you find that mentioned Hicksville when you did that trailer search? Probably like five or six. I only replied to one of them. Okay. And what do you recall those tweets saying about Hicksville? Um, the one that I replied to said that uh, there was some incident by the fire pit and, uh, and Johnny was yelling at Amber. Um, and I replied that my, that I didn't see that I was there all night and I was, you know, I was working that night. So I didn't see anything like that. So your best recollection on that one was that somebody said somebody was testifying that Johnny was yelling at Amber. Yeah. And I, I believe, um, grabbed her or something along those lines. Okay. Do you recall who said Johnny was yelling at Amber and grabbed her? I have no idea it was a stranger, so I didn't really pay attention to who was writing it. All right, and you said that you responded to it. How did you respond to it? I said, that's not what happened. I was there all night. Um, uh, yeah, basically, I'm that, paraphrasing. It was a, a Did few you say ago. anything about what you thought happened? I just said that didn't happen. I didn't say what, I mean, I think, I believe I said maybe something along the lines of, uh, from what I saw, Amber was the one acting jealous, not Johnny. And you said this to one of the tweets? Yes. Do you recall whether that was the Umbrella Man? I don't recall. That's a ridiculous name, though. Okay. So tell me about the other five uh, tweets that you recall seeing when you ran your trailer search. Um, I think they were similar in nature, but I didn't, I don't specifically remember the details of them. Uh, that was pretty much the only one I remembered and that's the only one I replied to. Do you remember anything about the other five and what was said? No. Okay. When you said that somebody told you about a security guard, what was your understanding of what the security guard said? Um, I just, I got a text that, uh, somebody in the trial had said, uh, that they were talking about the trailer palace at, during the trial. And so that's what led me to go on Twitter and do a search. And did you have any communications with the two innkeepers about what you knew or what you thought? No, I hadn't talked to them in years and so, still haven't regarding the case. So... How is it that the innkeepers then contacted you and said, do you mind if we give you the telephone number to the attorneys? Because they still have me in their phone. And um, Christy, who was the manager at the time, is the one that texted me and said, um, hey, do you mind if we pass this along? They, um, Mr. Depp's attorneys want to talk to you. Do you mind if we pass what along? Your phone number. Right, but how is it that, what is the communication you had with the innkeepers that even led them to understand that you believed you had knowledge about Hicksville, the Hicksville incident? There was no conversation. They knew because they were both working that same night. Um, Jenna was the innkeeper and she was there along with me that night. Christy was the one who texted me and she had come in the following morning for her shift. And I slept over, I was um, living in Keeper that night. So I'm trying to understand. So just based on the fact that seven years ago, they happened to know that you were working that night. Nine years ago, and it's because okay. I was there okay. with them. My math, well, it's 2022 right now, and that was what year? Oh, that was 2013. 2013, you're right, okay. So 
Well, how is it that out of the blue they remembered nine years ago uh, that that you worked there that night and that you might have some knowledge? I mean, to be honest, like we do get um, celebrities sometimes, but it was, you know, it's not that unmemorable. It's not like it's any other night of the week. So I'm sure they remembered the specifics of that night. Had Mr. Depp's attorneys ever attempted to contact you before? No. Had you ever attempted to contact Mr. Depp's attorneys before? No, I had no interest. All right, have you had any conversations with Mr. Depp's attorneys other than the one you described with Geraldine? Um, since? Yes. Well, I met with Camille last night. All right, and what did you, what was that conversation? Please describe. I just went through, um, you know, the story again that I had told Geraldine. And w let's let's hear what that story was. You want me to go through? Yes. The whole story, um, Your Honor. We would object to attorney work product. No. There's no attorney work product. No, I'll overrule that. All right. Oh, that's fine. That's okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, sir. Please yeah, sure. Um, that I. I described like them getting to the trailer palace, uh, the uh, me showing them around, the interactions I had when I was on duty with Mr. Depp and Mr. Her or Miss Heard, um, how uh, the evening progressed throughout the night, the levels of drinking and drug use that I witnessed, um, the uh, um, what the state of the damaged trailer the next morning um, and basically just yeah the details that I I, I had only um, you know spent total 45 minutes to an hour with Mr. Depp um, and Miss Heard throughout the e throughout the entire course of the night so it was my um, recollection of those events during that time and what did Ms. Vasquez said to you. Your Honor, this is uh, beyond, we object on the grounds that it's beyond the scope of the voir dire, no, which is I limited to the three she criteria. Said to him but, is may I very please finish critical. stating my objection, Your Honor? Go ahead, yes, sir. The objection is that it's beyond the scope of the voir dire, Your Honor, enumerated the three criteria which are relevant here. And this is a rebuttal witness, so. Your Honor, whatever Ms. Vasquez shared with him is going to be very important here because they knew by this time he was going to be a witness. So well, that, well, that was what, last night. So right. how does that fit into one of the three factors of deciding whether or not he's going to testify? Well, one of the three factors, you're, well, Your Honor, may I approach so that the witness doesn't hear? Okay, that's fine. Okay. Mr. Knight, did yes. Ms. Vasquez uh, provide you with any information that anyone had testified to or uh, said at any point? No, she didn't talk about anything except for asking me my experience and, and just getting a clear understanding of what my experience was. She didn't mention anything outside of the scope of what I saw and just asked me for the facts and told me, just tell the truth and let me know, you know. Do you know what any of the witnesses said in this trial? About, I mean, outside of what I described earlier with the, um, a friend of mine texting that someone was talking about Trailer Palace, I do not. Do you know whether any of the witnesses testified about any jealousy? Uh, other than the tweet that I replied to, no. All right. Thank you. Your Honor, may we approach? All right. Well, do you have any questions? Oh. All right. Sir, if you could ha have a seat back outside the courtroom. Sure. Thank you. Can I leave my water? Yes, you can leave your water.
All right. So based on weighing the factors, I'm going to allow Mr. Knight to testify. If we could get Mr. Knight back in. Now, if I knew you were going to do a sidebar, I wouldn't have made him leave. I never know. All right, sir, if you could just stay up, you could just stay there while we get the jury, okay? All right, are we ready for the jury? Okay. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Yeah. Just we're going to swear him in again in front of the jury, okay? see it. All right. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I apologize for the interruption. You're going to notice as we get closer to the end of the testimony, you're probably going to have some more interruptions, and I, I apologize for that, but there's just some matters we have to take up outside your presence, okay? All right. Thank you. All right. Your next witness. All right. Mr. Knight, if you could come forward to be sworn. G. Salmon Square, welcome. Testify truthfully in this case in the penalty of law. Thank you. Sir, if you have a seat. Good afternoon, Mr. Knight. Good afternoon, Camille. Would you please state your full name for the record? Morgan Higby Knight. Mr. Knight, where are you from? I live in Los Angeles, California. And what do you do for a living? So I currently own and run Hicksville Pines Bud and Breakfast in Idlewild, California. And I created and ran uh, Hicksville Trailer Palace in Joshua Tree, California starting in 2009. And how is Hicksville Pines Bud and Breakfast different from Hicksville Trailer Palace? So Hicksville Pines Bud and Breakfast is um, up in the mountains of Idlewild, which is a beautiful like snow town above Palm Springs. And um, all the units are A-frames instead of trailers, which we have. It's obviously a very different climate than Joshua Tree, which is a desert area. Um, the rooms which are themed at both places are uh, trailers, vintage trailers from the 50s through the 70s at Hicksville Trailer Palace. So um, there's also different kind of amenities. There's a pool in Joshua Tree. Um, there's a rec room up at uh, Hicksville Pines. When did you first become the owner of the Trailer Palace? Trailer Palace, I started building it in 2009. It took about a year with uh, my collaborator, Stephen Butcher, and on the trailers. And we got done and opened um, in 2010. Did there come a time that you sold the Hicksville Trailer Palace? Yeah, I did at the beginning of 2020. I um, had some health issues and just it was too much to run both at the same time. So I chose Idlewild because it was newer and shinier. And just for my sake, um, how long did you own the Trailer Palace? So 10 years of us being open, 11 years total. And what was the Hicksville Trailer Palace? So um, it started out as a uh, artist retreat. I was a filmmaker at the time and wanted a place to get away and work on film projects outside of Los Angeles. Uh, I also put in a recording studio so musicians could record records there. Uh, I had lived in New Orleans for five years and there's an amazing recording studio there called Kingsway where all the 
musicians would come and they'd live in this big mansion and record the records. And I just thought that was a really neat thing for artists to be able to get away and create their, um, create whatever they were working on. Over the course of the uh, build out of all the trailers, theme trailers, which I'm a huge fan of this hotel called Madonna Inn. And uh, so I wanted to do really detailed themed trailers. It became too expensive to just make a living off of an artist retreat. So I decided before I was done to make it a hotel as well. And what were your job responsibilities, generally speaking, when you owned the Hicksville Trailer Palace? So I would um, be live-in manager some nights, um, a couple nights a week. I would also drive out from Los Angeles twice a week and bring supplies that you can't get out in the Yucca Valley area and Joshua Tree. Um, there's just a lot of things like, you know, Smart and Finals, Costco's and stuff. So I would drive that stuff out. Um, there's also no uh, USPS. So sometimes I'd have to get things shipped to my house and drive them out as well. Uh, I would also just do um, constantly building and creating new stuff at Trailer Palace, uh, whether it's new trailers or amenities. So I would be working on that stuff as well. I'm a big fan of the fact that Disneyland is always making it better and better. And when you were the live-in manager, does, does that mean that you spent the night at the Hicksville Trailer Palace? Yeah, we have a house on site um, where the recording studio was and there's a bedroom in there. So whoever is live-in manager those nights um, stays in the house and, and basically lives there. There's a kitchen and everything. Have you ever met the plaintiff in this case, Mr. Depp? I had met him really briefly at the Viper Room in the late 90s. Um, uh, I had worked with some of the people that performed there and was good friends with uh, Girl Robin from the Pussycat Dolls and um, some other friends in this band, The Imposters. So I was there and I met him once. How about Miss Hurd? Ever met her? I had never met her before. Um, they were guests at the hotel. When was the first time that you met Mr. Depp and Ms. Heard together? Um, in late May 2013, uh, when they were guests, uh, Mr. Depp's assistant Nathan had rented out the entire place so they could have a night um, there in privacy. And what do you recall, if anything, about Mr. Depp and Ms. Heard's arrival to the Hicksville Trailer Palace? Mr. Depp got lost, uh, so. Um, his security guard who arrived early asked me if I could go fetch them because he had an old car that um, didn't really fare on the dirt roads out there, which are pretty horrible. So um, I went out and made sure that they got themselves and the car back to Hicksville safely. Do you remember approximately at what time that was? It was three to four in the afternoon. What was Mr. Depp's demeanor when they first arrived? At Trailer Palace, he was super excited about the place, really complimentary, um, just had a lot of questions and um, was just seemed like he was in a really great mood. And how about Miss Hurd's demeanor? Anything stick out? She was pretty quiet. Um, she uh, just kind of didn't say that much when I was giving them the tour of the grounds and the trailer. And was anyone else with Mr. Depp and Miss Hurd when they first arrived? Uh, there's people that are arriving throughout the afternoon, so um, there was, uh, um, I think 10 to 12 people total ended up staying. Uh, the security guard had gotten there earlier and just to check out the place, but, um, but yeah. And did I understand your testimony previously that the entire trailer park was rented out by Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd? Yeah, the whole place slept, I believe at the time, about 25 people, but there was only 10 to 12 in this party. And who was part of that party besides Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd? Um, I'm really horrible with names, but I remember one of them was uh, Ms. Hurd's sister and the security guard I mentioned before, but I honestly forgot his name too. What happened when Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd first came onto the property? So um, I gave them a tour of, we give all guests a tour of their specific trailer and the grounds and um, show them around the, uh, when someone rents the whole place, they get a 
another trailer called the bar trailer, which is basically a place to set up their alcohol and stuff. And some people in the group were just putting their beverages in that area. And where were you when uh, Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd, did there come a time when Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd went to the bar trailer? Um, I didn't notice most of the time that it, my interactions with them, everything's kind of centrally located. So there's a fire pit, bar trailer and picnic tables all right in the same area. So they were generally around that area the entire evening that I saw them. And what did you observe of Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd as the evening progressed? Um, so Mr. Depp was super, uh, just super curious and really nice. Um, he was also really interested in my innkeeper because she was a musician, so they would talk about music a lot. At one point, uh, the innkeeper who lived at the next door property went home and grabbed her guitar and they had um, sung a song or two around the campfire uh, in the early evening. Um, there was another instance where Mr. Depp, the innkeeper, her name is Jenna, and myself were talking about books and music and Miss Hurd came over and kind of interjected. She seemed a little annoyed that um, Mr. Depp wasn't spending time with her. What about Miss Hurd's demeanor made you think that she was annoyed? Um, I think just generally she, uh, it's hard, like she, I think, I don't know it, it was just it was just like a gut reaction like I, I, I can't describe it but um, you know how long were you with mr. Depp and miss Hurd that evening generally so throughout the course of the evening I was probably 40 mostly with mr. Depp but 45 minutes to an hour total um, so it was uh, yeah that's over the whole course until the end of the night after the check-in and did you have an opportunity to observe Mr. Depp, Depp interact with other people, guests on the property that evening? Yes, um, I saw him hanging out with a security guard at one point and um, outside of the uh, time that him and Jenna were singing around the campfire, he was off by himself um, a lot of the time and Ms. Hurd was over at the, uh, at the, um, campfire with her friends and seeming to have a good time. And if you haven't already, can you generally describe for the jury your observations of Miss Heard that evening? Um, yeah, she was, uh, she was, seemed to be having a really nice time with her friends around the campfire. Um, and yeah, everyone was in a pretty good mood. Did there come a time in the evening that you observed Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd have a disagreement or an argument? Yes. Um, I was speaking with Mr. Depp uh, just one-on-one -on -one, talking about Hicksville and um, Ms. Hurd uh, came over and she said that I want to talk to you and seemed really upset about something. So I went and um, back in the house because it was really, um, they went off on their own and they, she started yelling at him and I, I didn't want to hear it. It honestly was really triggering because I've been in a emotionally abusive Objection. relationship before. Objections, move to strike. What's the objection? You're up, I mean, we approach. Okay, sure. Mr. Knight, will you please just explain for us what you observed when you saw Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd having an argument? Yes. Um, so Ms. Hurd asked him to go talk um, off to the side and she was upset at him and she was yelling at him. Um, and I personally had 
that in Objection. Enough. All right, I'll sustain the objection. Okay. okay. If you could just explain to the jury um, what you observed when you saw Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd having an argument. Okay. Um, he was kind of cowering and seemed almost afraid, and um, it was really, like, odd to see because he was older than her, obviously, so, um, but I just went back in the house because I didn't Objection. want to. To what he did. All right, I'll sustain us too. Understood. So after you observed the argument, fair to say you went back to the tra to your house on site? Yes, Sunday? I did, yeah. Okay. Um, what happened after that? So when I saw Mr. Depp um, on my next rounds, he apologized profusely and said, I'm really sorry about that. She was upset. Objection, Your Honor, hearsay. Sustain. Next question. What, if any, type of reaction did Mr. Depp have? He was just really... Objection, Your Honor, hearsay. He's going to say it again. It's the reaction. It's not the statement. All right, if you could make that clear, that's yeah. fine. Just what type of physical reaction did Mr. Depp have after the argument between Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd? He honestly, throughout the rest of the night, became a lot more quiet and um, and was uh, just very more petulant. In the beginning of the night, he um, was a lot more outgoing and extroverted, and throughout, as the course of the night went on, he was less and less so and more quiet. Did you observe any of the guests consuming alcohol while on the property? Um, I assume they were. I mean, people had cups and there was alcohol set up in the bar trailer, but I didn't physically see them pour alcohol into their cup and cup go into the mouth, per se. Did you witness Mr. Depp drink any alcohol that evening? I couldn't say. Okay. Anything about Mr. Depp's demeanor that made you think he was perhaps intoxicated? Yes. Um, as the night went on, he, uh, I... I'm a former bar owner, so I'm, even though I wasn't drinking that night, I'm very familiar with the uh, signs. So um, just as the night went on, like I said, he became more and more quiet, but he also, as we would have conversations, his uh, head would kind of sway a little bit back and forth, which was a little, you know, it was he was much less sharp than he was earlier in the night. Did Miss Hurd appear intoxicated to you? Um, she did, uh, she seemed, I think when she was angry at him, it, it seemed like she was intoxicated, but that's just based on my experience and my own personal trauma dealing with abuse. Okay. Objection, Your Honor, move to strike. All right, I'll sustain the objection, I'll strike it from the record, please disregard that testimony. Did you observe anyone do or take drugs? I did not. Did you witness Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd interact other than the argument that you previously described for the jury? Um, the, at the end of the night, I heard a commotion. I was inside the house and came out. I couldn't tell what was going on. Um, and Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd were having a discussion about, um, about I, I'm not sure what, but then they went to their trailer. At that point, a lot of people had already gone to bed. So... Um, it just kind of petered out. Everyone went to bed, including myself, and I didn't hear anything else the rest of the night. What time did the evening come to an end? I'd say it was almost around 3 a.m. Did you ever see Mr. Depp grab anyone? Objection no. leading. Sustained. Did you ever see Mr. Depp become physical with anyone? Objection leading. Sustained. Next question. Did you ever witness Mr. Depp get angry that evening? Objection leading. Sustain. Okay. What if anything happened the next morning? Um, the next morning, we have checkout at noon at the time uh, before COVID. And so uh, around 11 o'clock, one of my innkeepers let me know that there was some damage. Objection, hearsay. Um, did something happen that caused you to go to Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd's trailer? Yes, I was informed that. Objection, hearsay. It's not being offered for the truth, Your Honor. I mean, it, may we approach on this okay, one topic? Okay, sure. Thank you. <laughs>
What, if anything, happened the next morning, Mr. Knight? Uh, the innkeepers let me know that there was some damage in one of the trailers, and it happened to be Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd's trailer. So I wanted to inspect the uh, trailer because I was extremely worried. Um, all those trailers that Steve and I worked on were like my babies, and um, the one they were staying in was the only one that was mostly original and restored 1950s style, and so I was uh, very concerned. So what did you observe when you went to the trailer? I observed that um, there was a light sconce by the bathroom um, in the bedroom that had been broken off the wall and a couple pieces were on the floor, and they were, um, and yeah, it was basically just broken. The light fixture was hanging on the wall still, except for the pieces that were on the floor. Did you come to understand how that happened? Objection, yeah. foundation, and All right, light. foundation, also seen as the foundation, how he knew. Did you ask how the sconce was broken? Objection, hearsay. Sustained. How often do light fixtures in the trailers break? Um, they break uh, pretty often. I mean, it's not like a usual thing, but things in the trailers generally get broken because it's all vintage trailers. And um, I would say as much as every couple weeks, there's some incident of damage in one of the trailers. In this case, Mr. Depp had told me that. Objection, do you say? Objection. Um, so anyway, yes. Beyond the light fixture, was anything else in the trailer damaged? No, everything else looked fine. In fact, we have a, a something we call a piggy fee uh, that we address to guests that if there's anything what we call inconsiderate or unusually large messes, we charge them extra for it for a $25 an hour cleaning fee, but they did not receive one of those because everything outside of light fixture looks fine. And what was your reaction to seeing the damaged light fixture? Um, to be honest, I was relieved because it was not a big deal. I just tucked, there was already another light in the room. So I just tucked the wires in the wall until I had a few months later time to um, buy, it was matching sconce with another one in the room. So I had to on eBay find a matching pair that would fit there. And uh, when I finally got around to it, I was able to get that and charge it to uh, Nathan who had, whose credit card I had. And what was your understanding of who Nathan was? Mr. Depp's assistant. Okay. And what did you charge Nathan or Mr. Depp for replacing that, that pair of light fixtures? The pair came out to $62. Okay. While you were on site, um, Mr. Knight, did you ever wear a mesh shirt? <laughs> No, I would uh, absolutely never wear that. <laughs> At any time during Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd's stay on the property, did you see Mr. Depp become physical with anyone? Objection I did not. leading. Okay. Overruled. That's fine. I'm sorry, that answer was? Uh, I, I never saw Mr. Depp get physical with anyone when I saw him. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Right. Cross-examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Knight, you are a pretty big fan of Johnny Depp, aren't you? I am not. To be honest, uh, throughout the evening, I... Uh, I sorry, I, I just asked you one question. Oh, I, I, I didn't apologize. ask you the rest of that. I you apologize. wanted to participate in this trial, didn't you? I did not. I you was knew? asked by the attorney, and I wanted to... They. Um, asked me and I said, I'll be happy to come and tell the truth. You knew this was on camera, that it was being broadcast to a lot of people, and you saw testimony, did you not in this case, and you seized the moment and responded to the umbrella guy, the lead person for Mr. Depp's Twitters, did you not? Objection, Your Honor. Argumentative compound. Oh, overruled. Uh, Mr. Umbrella Guy is the lead the lead you one. know that he is he leads one of the most predominant pro dep Twitters out there. I have no idea. I don't care or follow the umbrella guy. In fact, you do follow a Twitter called Johnny Depp fan, don't you? 
Absolutely not. You don't? That's your testimony no. under oath? It is my testimony under oath. All right. And on April 21st, Mr. Depp testified in this case about Hicksville, didn't he? I wasn't here. And in fact, you tweeted in response to the umbrella guy <laughs> on April 21, 22, quote, that never happened. I was with them all night. Amber was the one acting all jealous and crazy. Do yes, you recall I, writing that? I do recall writing that. Michelle, can well, you bring that up, please? We're going to call it Defendants 1903. 1903. And I'm going to go ahead and ask you to redact, leave in the umbrella guy and the date and the bringing in the Hicksville. Your Honor, I'm sorry. I'm just... While she's working on that, did you write and direct a piece called Matters of Consequence back in 1999? I did. And didn't Mr. Depp's first wife, Lorianne Allison, work as a makeup artist on that? She absolutely did. And while we're looking at that, uh, Four days after you tweeted to Umbrella Man, you that was Umbrella Guy. The um Umbrella Guy. Okay. Well, all right. Now we have this up. I'm going to ask you to take a look. What is Defendant's Exhibit 1903? Do you see that? I do. Okay, and that's from that Umbrella Guy on 42122. Correct. Correct. And it says bringing in the Hicksville incident accusations. Do you see that? I do. And there's clearly Mr. Depp testifying there, likely a video, right? Okay. And you respond, that never happened. I was with them all night. Amber was the one acting all jealous and crazy. Do you see that? I do. Your Honor, I'm going to move the admission of defendants 1903. Any objection? Yeah, Your Honor, we believe the first part of the um that umbrella guy's tweet should be unredacted Re for redact context. Oh, un well. I have no it, idea it, what it, I was replying it, to. It's, it's hearsay. It's, it's rank hearsay, and the context Your Honor, is not necessary. Your Honor, approach. Of course. Take a look. All right, can make that redaction. Would that redaction any objection? No, Your Honor, thank you. Okay, 1903 will be in evidence with, as redacted. Now, so you reached out to the umbrella guy in this text, this Twitter, right? I wouldn't call it reaching out. Okay. And in fact, the umbrella guy is in Mr. A Mr. Adam Waldman. Do you know who Adam Waldman is? I have no idea. Well, he's testified earlier that he talks to the umbrella guy. That um, he what? He talks to the umbrella guy? Yeah. Were you aware of that? I honestly, this sounds like a... Like schizophrenia. Okay. Now, four days after this 
uh, event where you texted, Your Honor, yeah, it's in, okay, good. Four days after that, you tweeted something pretty nasty about Elon Musk, didn't you? I did. Okay, thank you. So you don't like Elon Musk, right? Objection well, relevance. Oh, I, I don't know Elon uh, Musk. Overruled. Thank you. So that was uh, the context of that is that he had... I didn't ask you for the context. I apologize. Okay. Um, but you texted something that had swear words in it. Would you agree about Elon Musk? Yes. Okay. Now, let's talk about your uh, recollections here. 45 minutes to an hour. Your recollection is that Mr. Depp actually drove there? Yes. What type of car was he driving? An old one that was a convertible. An old convertible? I'm not a car guy, so I couldn't express okay. the model. All right, and your recollection was this was May of 2013? Yes. Okay, do you recall when in May? Late May. Okay. Now, you said that you spent a total of 45 minutes to an hour with Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd, is that correct? After that, mostly Mr. Depp but that's after the tour and after they were checked in throughout the course of the night. Okay, and you don't recall any of the people that were there other than Ms. Hurd's sister and the security guard, correct? I don't recall any of their names. Do you remember how many of them were female? I believe it was predominantly female. Do you remember how many males were there? I don't, outside of the security guard. Do you remember what any of the other people looked like? Um, they honestly just seemed like youngish hipsters, like for lack of a better term. I know that previously a couple of them had stayed at Hicksville Trailer Palace. That's how they knew about the place. Okay. So you didn't, you don't recall seeing how much anybody had to drink that night, correct? I did not witness that. And you, do you recall the use of drugs at all? I did not witness that. Okay. Were you sitting at any point with these people at the campfire? I was not. Okay. Um, and when you said that, uh, that you saw Ms. Hurd and Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd was yelling at Mr. Depp, where were they? They, she pulled him uh, for a chat and it was off um, towards their trailer, like a little bit off towards the dirt. How many feet were there between the campfire and their trailer? The campfire and their trailer? Yes. Approximately 75. Okay. So where in that 75 feet did Ms. Hurd pull Mr. Depp and uh, yell at him and he cowered? 20. Okay. 20 from, from the campfire. From the, the campfire. Yeah. So your testimony is that Ms. Hurd grabbed Mr. Hurd, pulled him 20 feet over, yelled at him, and he cowered. Yes, that's that's what I witnessed. And then did they go back? I, I went inside the house. So you don't know whether they returned to the campfire or they returned to their trailer? I do not. Okay. Um, and do you know whether there were any uh, disagreements or physical communications, anything of that nature at the campfire? I do not. Do you know whether Mr. Depp did anything to anybody else at the campfire? I didn't see anything. Okay, do you know whether Mr. Depp grabbed anybody's wrist and told them, asked them if they knew how many pounds of pressure it took to break their wrist? I wasn't there the whole time. Okay, do you, is it your testimony that Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd went last to their trailer, everybody else went before them? They all, the rest of the people, I think about half of them had already gone to bed and they went, um, they went, I can't, it was all around the same time at the end of the night that the rest kind of scattered. There might have been a couple of people that went right after them or right before, but it was all around the same time. Okay, so, so your recollection is that when Amber and Johnny Depp went back to their trailer, that dissipated, Every, everybody then left at that point? Yes. Okay. Now, uh, how far away was your house that you were staying in from the trailer that Amber and Johnny Depp were staying in? I'd say it was about 75 feet away. Okay. 
Um, and the next time that you saw or heard anything was when you went there in the morning and saw the broken scots. Is that yes, correct? Yes, I didn't hear anything after I went to bed. Okay. And that's the extent of your knowledge? Yes. Okay. I have no further questions. All right. Redirect. <clears throat> Mr. Knight, how did you get involved in this trial? <laughs> um, I got a text from one of our old employees who I didn't talk Objection, to Objection, hearsay. Don't tell us what the text said, just how did okay. you get involved? I got a, I got a text uh, from, I, I got a... I'd still hearsay, you're under okay. objection. No. Overruled. Thank you. Go on, Mr. Knight. I was asked uh, if uh, it was... No. Objection, that. hearsay. I apologize. Um, uh, what did you... I got a text. When did you received a text. Okay. Yes. From whom? From a former employee. Okay. And how long had it been since you had heard from this former employee? Approximately five years. Okay. And did you contact Mr. Depp or any of his attorneys? Objection leading? Overruled. I did not. How did you get in touch with Mr. Depp's attorneys? They got in touch with me. I Objection, hearsay. Oh, oh, oh. Go on, Mr. Knight. Uh, they, they reached out to me. Uh, okay. Sorry. It's I, okay. I don't have an objection right now. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Only if he talks more. Next question. And how do you feel about participating in this trial? Objection, relevance. It's extremely relevant considering that they have accused him of uh, being... Oh, 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 oh. Thank you. How do I feel about it? Yeah. Um, I'm happy to tell what I saw, and that's the extent of it. I really don't care <laughs> outside of that. Thank you very much, Mr. Knight. Nothing All further. right. I assume this witness is not subject to recall. Is that correct? All right. So you're free to go. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Your next witness. Or is it going to be a deposition, or is it going to oh. Apologies, Your Honor. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Dr. Shaw. Okay, Thank Dr. you for calls Shaw. Dr. Shaw. Okay. Dr. Shaw. Thank you, sir. All right, yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, Dr. Shaw. Can you please state your name for the record? Uh, my name is Richard John Shaw. Dr. Shaw, can you please describe your educational background? Um, I'm a psychiatrist. Um, I went to medical school at the University of London in England. Um, I went straight off to high school. That's actually the system in the, the British medical system. I did two years of preclinical training um, and then three years of uh, clinical work with, pa uh, with patients. Um, following that, I moved to New Zealand to do an internship. It was an internship in um, neurology, medicine, surgery, and psychiatry. Uh, I spent three years in New Zealand, and I um, did a, a year of psychiatry residency training. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> and... <coughs> Following that, I um, <coughs> excuse me. Following that, I moved back. I moved here to the United States for the first time and did a residency in adult psychiatry at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, which is in New York. Um, that was four years of, of training um, in the Bronx, and um, I also did some subspecialty training in um, family therapy, couples, and, and family therapy um, as in my fourth year. And after that, I moved to California, um, and I've worked at Stanford. I, I studied at Stanford. I did a fellowship in child and adolescent psychiatry, um, and I've been at Stanford pretty much since then. Dr. Shaw, what is your current position? Um, I'm a professor of psychiatry in the Department of Psychiatry at Stanford. I also uh, run what's called the um, Psychiatry Consult Service at the Children's Hospital at Stanford. What, if any, professional certifications have you received? 
Um, I have um, what's called board certification in adults and general psychiatry. Um, I obtained that from the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology in 1991. Um, and then I obtained subspecialty board certification in child and adolescent psychiatry in 1993. Are you a member of any professional organizations in the field of psychiatry? Yes, I am. I'm a member of the uh, American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. I'm also a member of the Academy of Consultation Liaison Psychiatry. How long have you been practicing psychiatry? Um, if you include my um, training in psychiatry residency in the US, that would be since 1985. Is that approximately 35 years? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, what percentage of your practice involves treating patients? Um, yeah, approximately three quarters of my time is working with patients. Um, I, I work in the pediatric hospital treating a combination of um, mainly children and adolescents with um, severe medical con conditions, um, but also working with uh, parents of children who have medical, severe medical conditions. Um, I also consult to the pediatric emergency room and we evaluate patients who show up with um, suicide attempts and other serious situations. What does the remaining quarter of your practice entail? Um, well, as a professor, I have to do a number of um, academic activities. Um, so I do um, research. I do a lot of teaching. I give lectures. I um, supervise residents, medical students, and fellows in psychiatry. I, um, I do some administrative work. Um, yeah, so it's a pretty diverse you know, very day and week. Can you tell the jury a little bit about your research and academic work? Yeah, a lot of my research has involved um, looking at the issue of trauma and PTSD in parents who have uh, medically fragile children. Um, a lot of these parents are naturally really affected by their, their, um, their child's illness and develop trauma symptoms. Um, so I've developed some interventions to try to help parents um, you know, provide support and treatment to reduce their symptoms of trauma. Have you published articles or books in your area of expertise? Yes, I have. I've, I've published um, approximately 70 or well, probably closer to 80 peer-reviewed manuscripts in different scientific journals. Um, I've also published a number of book chapters on, on various topics, um, approximately 30. And I have... Um, published three textbooks, um, one of which has gone into a second edition on topics that are related to my area of expertise. And one of them actually is, a, is about the treatment of PTSD in parents of uh, premature infants. Have you published um, a book through the APA? Um, actually, all of those books um, were published through the, the APA, the American Psychiatric Association. They have a, a publishing house, and that's been my um, publishing uh, company. What is the APA? Um, the APA, the American Psychiatric Association, uh, not to be confused with the American Psychological Association, is um, a professional organization that represents psychiatrists in the U.S., um, the last time I, I looked at this, I think there's about 37 or 38,000 members. And the, the, the APA has many different roles. Um, one of it is advocacy um, in psychiatry in, in the US, but it also has an important role in terms of education. So they, they host an annual scientific meeting every year in which psychiatrists will present their research. Um, it publishes a number of journals in the field and um, from time, well, fairly frequently it publishes um, guidelines for, for professional practice or about ethical guidelines that they um, hope their members will follow as part of their practice. What ways are you involved with the APA? Um, <clears throat> well, I, I mentioned my publishing. Um, I, um, I also present at the scientific meetings. I, I last presented in 2021, during COVID, was, was virtually, but on the topic of group therapy for parents with trauma symptoms. Um, 
I, you know, I follow the APA and their the various guidelines. I, I think it's a really influential and important in, um, um, institution. Going back to your credentials, what, if any, professional awards have you received? Um, I've been given a, a number, several teaching awards at Stanford University and um, my, um, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry that I mentioned um, uh, honored me with an award for service to my specialty um, um, several years ago. I don't remember exactly when. Have you given any public presentations in the field of psychiatry? Yes, I, um, that's part of our work as an academic psychiatrist is to, to lecture, to give presentations. So I, I present um, fairly frequently at annual scientific meetings, as I mentioned. Um, I've been invited to give grand round presentations at different medical centers, um, including the University of Pennsylvania and Harvard. So that's just part of our, I think our role is to try to educate um, our colleagues about our work. Have you testified as an expert in the field of psychiatry before? Yes, I have. On how many occasions? Um, I would estimate, um, in terms of de deposition and trial testimony, approximately 50 times in the past 15, 20 years. What type of cases did you testify as an expert in? Um, they're pretty varied. So um, some of them have been medical malpractice. Um, I've also done a number of cases evaluating uh, victims who've um, been uh, subject to physical or sexual assault or trauma. What work were you asked to do in this case? Um, my role in this case was to give my opinions about the testimony and opinions from, of Dr. Spiegel, whom you heard from yesterday morning. And what work have you done to form your opinion? I, um, I was present yesterday in court listening to his testimony. Um, I have viewed his um, depositions. He had two depositions earlier this year, and I, um, I watched those depositions. I've also read a lot of deposition testimony. Um, for example, testimony by Mr. Depp's psychiatrist, Dr. Blaustein, uh, by his physician, Dr. Kipper, and nurse, Debbie Lloyd, I've reviewed depositions by many of the um, therapists involved in this case, including um, Dr. Banks, the relationship consultant, um, Dr. Um, Cohen, who was Ms. Hurd's um, therapist, and I think Dr. Anderson, who I think provided some couples therapy. Uh, I've also reviewed um, the medical records of Dr. Kipper and Dr. Blaustein and some various email communications. Um, I think a lot of the information that has been talked about here. Thank you. Your Honor, at this time, we'd like to offer Dr. Shaw as an expert in the field of psychiatry. <clears throat> Any objection? Uh, we have approach. Okay. So, any objection? Uh, no objection, Your Honor. All right. So, so he'll be he'll be moved as an expert. Thank you. 
Dr. Shaw, um, you testified that you observed Dr. Spiegel's testimony yesterday? Yes, that's correct. And to reorient the jury, can you please generally describe the main areas in which Dr. Spiegel testified? Uh, yes, he... Did you have objection, Your Honor? They heard what he testified to. What's his opinion All right. about? Foundation to reorient them? That, that's okay. We can move forward. Okay. Do you have an opinion of Dr. Spiegel's testimony? Yes, I do. And what is your opinion? I, I have a couple of primary opinions. Um, the first is, is, is that I, my opinion is that he violated the ethical principles that are outlined in the Goldwater Rule when he gave his opinions about um, Mr. Depp, specifically with relationship to personality traits and his cognitive abilities. Um, my second primary opinion would be that, um, the re that the Dr. Spiegel's opinions um, were unreliable and that he had insufficient objection, information. Your object, objection, Your Honor. All right. You got to approach? Yeah.
Dr. Shaw, you mentioned the Goldwater Rule. What led up to the publication of the Goldwater Rule? Um, the Goldwater Rule um, came about um, in response to uh, an incident that, that occurred during the 1964 presidential election when Senator Barry Goldwater was running as a Republican candidate. And there was a magazine called Fact Magazine that started a campaign to discredit Senator Goldwater. And they obtained a mailing list from the AMA and sent out a single survey uh, questionnaire to, all, to about 12,000 psychiatrists in the US asking if they felt that Senator Goldwater was fit to run for office. And about 2,000 psychiatrists responded, a 1,000 of whom expressed very negative opinions about Senator Goldwater and made comments such as, for example, he was a megalomaniac, he was a paranoid schizophrenic, that he had narcissistic personality disorder. Um, and as a result of that, um, he was replaced as a candidate um, and then went on to sue Fact Magazine for defamation of character. And he was successful in that lawsuit. Um, and in response to this incident, um, the American Psychiatric Association that I think was really concerned about how psychiatry was being represented and statements psychiatrists were making about someone they had never met or evaluated, um, issued the Goldwater Rule. And the main premise of the Goldwater Rule was that um, it was improper for a psychiatrist to render a professional opinion about a public figure um, unless they had personally and closely evaluated them. Um, what justifications did the APA provide, other than the ones you mentioned, for enacting the Goldwater Rule? Um, they wanted to make sure that uh, psychiatric illness wasn't being stigmatized. They wanted to um, ensure that individuals weren't defamed by statements made by a psychiatrist that, didn't, that weren't backed up by medical evidence. And they also wanted to preserve the integrity of the psychiatric profession, since I think the public in general and a psychiatrist speaks out publicly and expresses an opinion, a psychiatric opinion, um, people generally like to take that seriously. And the APA wanted to make sure that those opinions were credible and could be relied upon. Have there been any updates to the Goldwater Rule? Yes, yeah, since um, 1973, which was when the Goldwater Rule first came out, there have been um, a number of um, revisions and um, publications by the APA, they're called Annotations in Psychiatry, in which the Goldwater Rule has been better defined and expanded in, in some, to some degree. Um, so, for example, in 2017, in this, um, this publication, they, the APA reasserted that it was um, not ethical to provide a psychiatric or professional opinion about someone who had not been evaluated personally by that psychiatrist, that it was um, unethical to provide an evaluation without obtaining consent from that individual. Um, they also um, sort of really kind of defined what a, prof what a professional opinion is and, that prof and, how, and how they defined it is that an opinion that a psychiatrist expresses about someone's speech, behavior, or any characteristic about that person, um, if it's, that opinion is made using the expertise, experience, and knowledge inherent in the practice of psychiatry, that is considered a professional opinion. So it, it might include making a diagnosis or not making a diagnosis. And the other I think a couple of important things about that 2017 document were that the APA um, specified that if a psychiatrist is to give an opinion about someone, about the diagnosis or personality characteristics, whatever, 
that they have to follow an appropriate methodology. They have to do an evaluation that follows the standard practice of a psychiatrist here in the US. Um, and if they don't do that, they are considered to be um, a, you know, affecting the integrity of these, both the psychiatrist and the psychiatric profession. And, and this revision of the Goldwater um, rule definitely received a lot of support. The president of the APA at the time stated that breaking the Goldwater rule was um, irresponsible, um, stigmatizing, and, and definitely unethical. So that was a, statement, a very strong statement from the president of the APA. What other medical organizations have weighed in on this issue? Yeah, the number of organizations have their own sort of version of the Goldwater Rule. Um, the American Medical Association that represents physicians in the US um, has an annual meeting um, uh, and it's, they, they have a, what's called a Council of Ethical and Judicial Affairs and they had a meeting in 2017 in Honolulu and they came up with their own statement about uh, the issue of whether physicians can provide opinions without directly evaluating somebody. And, and their opinion was that physicians should refrain from giving a psychiatric diagnosis um, about any public figure, including celebrities and people in the media. Are there exceptions to the Goldwater Rule? There are exceptions, yeah. And I think Dr. Spiegel um, had a lot to say about this yesterday when he was saying that if you couldn't express an opinion without evaluating someone, it sort of made the whole specialty of, or role of experts in the court sort of null and void. But there are exceptions and situations in which an expert can give testimony in court. So one good example would be if there was a medical malpractice case or if there was a case about, that involved a patient who'd committed suicide and the courts wanted to find out whether the psychiatrist had followed appropriate practice, the expert can review medical records and can give an opinion based on those records, provided those records um, have sufficient information, for example, about the diagnoses, about the treatment, about how the patient was responding or not responding to treatment. Did you form an opinion about whether Dr. Spiegel complied with the Goldwater Rule? Uh, well, well, my opinion is that he did not. He expressed a number of professional opinions about Mr. Depp um, that we heard about yesterday. Um, and again, he did so without um, an evaluation, without consent. Um, he did not follow the guidelines of the APA in the 2017 revision, where it was considered important that um, there be sufficient information obtained by that expert to give an opinion. Um, so I, I, I would definitely felt that they were, his, his conduct, unfortunately, did violate the Goldwater Rule. And specifically, what opinions of, um, that Dr. Spiegel gave yesterday did you, do you feel violated the Goldwater Rule? Yeah, I think that, well, there were sort of two primary ones. Um, the first that you heard about was that Dr. Spiegel had professional opinions about Mr. Depp's personality. And he talked a lot about how he believed that Mr. Depp had narcissistic personality traits. So, um, and, and he also, you know, talked a lot about narcissistic personality disorder. So, narcissistic personality disorder is a diagnosis in um, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. It's called the DSM-5 for short. It's a diagnostic manual published by the APA. Objection, Your Honor.
Go ahead, Dr. Shaw, please continue. Sure, so I was, I was just talking about narcissistic personality disorder in the DSM-5. So the diagnostic criteria for that are, um, I'm not gonna remember every word about this, but essentially it's a, a pattern of grandiosity, um, a need for admiration, um, a, a lack of empathy that's demonstrated by that person since young adulthood. And the DSM-5 has nine specific criteria. And for someone to meet the diagnosis, you have to meet five of those criteria. And so when, as a psychiatrist, we're trying to make a diagnosis of any personality disorder or any diagnosis in general, um, the normal um, professional guidelines would dictate that we would do a very careful diagnostic interview and there are actually interviews specifically written to assess personality disorders. Um, it's also possible to have um, the individual fill out questionnaires. There's something called the Narcissistic Personality Inventory. This is a 40 item checklist that um, taps into various components of narcissistic personality disorder. And it's also possible to get psychological testing um, like the MMPI that I think you heard about in reference to um, one of the other experts here. So with all of this information, um, including collateral information from um, family members, co work colleagues, um, information of that sort, it is possible to come up with a diagnosis of narcissistic personality disorder. So in the case of Dr. Spiegel, he had none of this information, even though he came out and stated with what he described as a degree of medical certainty that Mr. Depp had narcissistic personality traits. And if you remember somewhat towards the end of his um, testimony yesterday, he was asked to, um, since he couldn't provide any um, documentation from the medical record about narcissistic personality disorder or narcissistic personality traits, he was asked about what um, is referred to a lot in, this, in his testimony as record evidence. So information that he obtained from depositions, from text messages, from emails, what, what, whatever. And um, so he was asked to give, I think, um, five examples of record evidence that would make it seem like Mr. Depp met criteria for narcissistic personality traits. And I'll just mention a couple of them, just, just, just to illustrate my opinion is that that testimony was, did not really hold together. So he stated, for example, that um, uh, one of the criteria for narcissism is um, narcissistic personality disorder is a sense of entitlement. And the example Dr. Spiegel gave is that he believed that Miss Heard married him for his money. So clearly, a sense of entitlement is a, from a psychiatry perspective, that's very different from a belief that someone wanted you for your money. Um, a second example that um, was given was that he was asked to give an example of how Mr. Depp had shown that he was envious of others, which is another criterion for narcissistic personality disorder. And the example that Dr. Spiegel gave is that Mr. Depp was jealous of Ms. Hurd because he believed she was having an affair with Mr. Franco. Um, now, if we look at these two terms as a psychiatrist, there's a big difference between being envious and being jealous. As a psychiatrist, when I think about envy, I think about um, somebody wants something that someone else has, and it makes them get bad. I think this is going beyond his All right. he, He's giving his opinion as to how Dr. Spiegel violated the Goldwater rule with respect to his testimony about narcissistic personality Which traits. He, he did, but now sustain the objection. Next question. Okay. Um, okay, and you mentioned two major examples. Um, what was the second one? The second one was confusing being envious from, with being jealous. Oh, sorry, um, Dr. Shaw, I mean, 
Um, you mentioned two major examples of ways uh, Dr. Spiegel violated the Goldwater rule. What is the second? Oh, sure. Um, so the other big category had to do with um, Dr. Spiegel's evaluation of Mr. Depp's cognitive abilities. And he, his general opinion was that Mr. Depp had um, deficits in his memory, in his attention, in his processing speed, in his, he, that he had word finding difficulties. Um, again, Dr. Spiegel did not evaluate Mr. Depp and the information that he relied upon, um, there were two, two pieces of information. The first was that he watched a very long deposition that Mr. Depp gave um, the day after, I think he had flown back from London uh, to the East Coast. And um, he made observations about Mr. Depp's behavior in that, ob in that deposition um, and felt that he could opine or give an opinion about processing speed and other, other cognitive aspects. Um, he also made reference to something you heard about yesterday, this thing called the mini mental status examination. This is a, a brief screen for um, memory and cognitive functioning that is often done. And uh, he testified that Dr. Blastein had administered the mini mental status examination. Um, and although, you know, from the records, all we know is that- Objection, Your Honor. Sustain the objection. Um, Dr. Shaw, without going into Dr. Blaustein's record, what information does a mini mental exam provide? Objection, Your Honor. It's beyond the scope of this designation. No. Overruled as to that limited question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the mini mental status is, um, it's, it's a series of about 10 or 11 questions and tasks that someone completes and you get a score out of 30. Um, what Dr. Uh, Spiegel testified was that Mr. Depp could not recall three words after five minutes. And he used that as an example of Mr. Depp having cognitive deficits that he specifically attributed to Mr. Depp's alcohol and substance abuse. And um, he really did not have sufficient information. I, I liken a, a mini mental status exam as it's like taking someone's temperature. If it's uh, elevated. Object, objection, Your Honor, I not think it's going beyond. No, I'll sustain the objection. Okay. Um, now it's probably a good time for a break. If... Okay, sure. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I know you had a break, but we didn't. So we're going to go ahead and take our afternoon break for 15 minutes. Do not discuss the case and do not do any outside research, okay? You can stay right there, Doctor. All right, your, your excuse for the 15 minutes too, sir, doctor. Okay, we'll come back at 4.17 then, finish the day? Okay.
can be seated. All right, your next question. Thank you. Dr. Shaw, is the Goldwater Rule limited to diagnoses? It's not. It's, it's um, includes all professional opinions. Do you agree with Dr. Spiegel that the Goldwater Rule doesn't apply to expert witnesses? I, I don't agree, no. How could Dr. Spiegel express an opinion without violating the Goldwater Rule? Um, this has actually been a, a topic that's been written and published about. So it is possible for someone to give testimony about a matter without interviewing someone. Um, and there's certain sort of ways that it should be framed. So for example, when uh, Dr. Spiegel was testifying about um, the report that Mr. Depp was unable to recall these three objects, what he could have done is said that I have not personally examined Mr. Depp, so I can't speculate about his um, cognitive state or um, ability to, to function cognitively. However, it is possible that someone who's not able to recall three objects um, could have issues related to substance use, which was what his opinion was. However, what he, could, what he should have done in expressing his opinion is then have followed up to say that in order to really establish whether these were relevant and significant cognitive deficits, Mr. Depp should have had psychological testing to establish the nature of these deficits. And he should also have added that there are other potential explanations for these findings. So, for example, it's possible that Mr. Depp... Uh, objection, Your Honor. He's now going past the designation. Okay. I think he's just opining as to, um, or is responding to Dr. Spiegel's testimony yesterday. No, he's opining as to what Dr. Spiegel could have said, but it's past the, uh, whether he, about the right. I'll, I'll, if we can move on. Okay. Um, who's qualified to give an opinion about cognitive deficits and processing speed? Um, it would have to be someone who could um, conduct the type of neuropsychological testing that I was mentioning. You can't establish the presence of cognitive deficits without Objection, a battery of tests. Objection, again, this is beyond the gold water. Oh, overruled. Yeah, you can't establish cognitive deficits without appropriate neuropsychological testing. And that can only be done by a psychologist or neuropsychologist. So a psychiatrist like Dr. Spiegel would be giving an opinion outside of his area of expertise if he gave an opinion about um, cognitive deficits that required psychological testing to be further um, evaluated. Dr. Spiegel yesterday testified about the practice of forensic psychiatry. Do you recall that testimony? Yes, I do. What is forensic psychiatry? Uh, forensic psychiatry is a specialty of psychiatry that relates to matters on the intersection between psychiatry and the law. So, for example, what we're doing today is forensic psychiatry, where a psychiatrist comes into court and gives an opinion about a matter to help the court may come to an opinion. Are there professional standards that govern the practice of forensic psychiatry? Yes, there are. And what organizations have issued those standards? One of the primary organizations that has issued guidelines about um, the practice of forensic psychiatry is called the American Academy of Psychiatry and the Law. This is an organization that represents forensic psychiatrists. And uh, it has published guidelines about what constitutes um, an ethical and sound practice of doing a forensic assessment and providing a psychiatric opinion. Uh, so this guideline, I think, I think it was published in 2015, um, actually contains many elements that are consistent with the Goldwater Rule. So for example, it states that um, for a forensic assessment to be done, there has to be informed consent, and there should be a very thorough, comprehensive evaluation that would include reviewing past records, past psychiatric history, it would include doing what's called a mental status examination, which is a careful evaluation of someone's mood, cognition, things of that nature. And um, 
the guidelines do state that it is reasonable um, or permitted to provide an opinion without an evaluation, but if you're going to do that, there's some things that you have to really make clear in your opinion when you express that opinion. And the first is that you have to acknowledge the limitations of your opinion and not, like Dr. Spiegel, say that his opinion was held with a degree of medical certainty. You have to explain what's missing, what data you did not have that you were not able to rely upon in coming to that opinion. Um, you also have to talk about what additional information you would need to come to that opinion. And even though the, these guidelines say it's, it's permissible to do this, um, the, the, the text is still, um, I think, um, not fully in support of psychiatrists doing this. So their statements are that opinions rendered without a proper database, which is what we as psychiatrists rely upon to make diagnoses and, and give opinions, professional opinions, is questionable and not generally recommended. Did you form an opinion about Dr. Spiegel's testimony with respect to these practice guidelines? Yes, I did. And what is your opinion? Well, my opinion is that he did not follow those guidelines. So, um, for example, he did not have consent. He did not do even a, a, a basic evaluation of Mr. Depp. Um, when he gave his opinions, as I just mentioned, he, he said they were opinions that he had to a degree of medical certainty. And he did not um, make any statements about what other additional information he would have wanted to make that opinion. So, for example, when, when asked about should neuropsychological testing be performed, he said most patients don't have access to that, which, are, which is actually not at all true. I mean, every medical school has neuropsychologists that can do testing. So I think that was um, an unfortunate statement. Um, so, so I think the, those are the, the primary ways in which the Goldwater Rule was violated and the, and the practice guidelines were not adhered to. Um, Dr. Shaw, yesterday Dr. Spiegel was talking about correlation and causation. What is the difference between correlation and causation? Objections. It's not in this designation. It is. We can approach and I can show you. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Dr. Shaw. Yes, so the, the difference between a correlation and causation, um, correlation is a statistical analysis of a relationship between two different factors. So in Dr. Spiegel's testimony, he talked about, you know, there being a correlation between opinions he had about Mr. Depp, his narcissistic personality traits, his substance abuse, things of that nature. Um, <laughs> So a correlation doesn't say anything about whether or not these factors caused that, you know, the, the behavior he was, was discussing. Um, perhaps one of the easiest ways I could describe this difference between correlation and causation is if we, if we look at the issue of, of measles, if you'll bear with me. So there's a correlation between being young and catching measles. Um, now we know that measles is not caused by being young. Measles is caused by a virus. But young children have not been exposed to the virus, they don't have the immunity, so they have a higher rate of measles. So the difference statistically is 
well, well, the difference is, is between causation and correlation is illustrated by that example. So another way I might put this is if, you know, if we had 100 people in a room, just bringing it back to the issue of um, IPV that Dr. Spiegel was testifying about. Let's say we had 70 people who had all the risk factors for IPV and 30 people who had no risk factors for IPV. So what can we say about the, those 70 people? We can't say that any single one of those people has perpetrated IPV, even though they may have all the risk factors. And if we look at the 30 people who have no risk factors, we also can't say whether or not they have perpetrated IPV. So the actual presence of risk factors for IPV that Dr. Spiegel was talking about, they say absolutely nothing about what happened in this case. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Nothing further. All right, cross-examination. Good afternoon, Dr. Shaw. Good afternoon. Uh, you're not offering any opinion as to Mr. Depp's psychology, correct? That's correct. Right. And you testified a lot about the Goldwater Rule. Um, you know of no case where a expert has been excluded from testifying based on the Goldwater Rule, correct? I don't know about the whole universe of cases. It's possible, but I don't know personally about one. And, and you, before this case, you've never offered an opinion on the Goldwater Rule before, correct? That's correct. And you've never written an article on the Goldwater Rule, correct? I have not. And you've never given a presentation on the Goldwater Rule, correct? I have not. And you've never been on any committees regarding the Goldwater Rule, correct? I have not. Okay. And you, you agree that you've testified that there are exceptions to the Goldwater Rule about having to interview the subject, right? Yes. And you understand that Dr. Spiegel requested to meet with Mr. Depp twice, but Mr. Depp declined, correct? I'm aware of that. And Mr. D Mr. Dr. Spiegel stated in his designation and at, at trial yesterday that he did not meet with Mr. Depp, right? Yes. Okay. Um, can we put up uh, Defendant's Exhibit 1904? Dr. Shaw, have, have, you, have you seen the opinions of the Ethics Committee on the Principles of Medical Ethics? Yes. Okay. And if you could turn to 79 of the PDF, it's, and it's actually, thank you. You see where it's highlighted here? Yes. And it says, psychiatrists have also argued that the Goldwater Rule is not sound because psychiatrists are sometimes asked to render Objection, opinions. hearsay. He's an expert. Mm -hmm. Without conducting an examination of an individual, examples occur in particular in certain forensic cases and consultative roles. This objection attempts to subsume the rule with its exceptions. What this objection misses, however, is that the rendering of expertise and or an opinion in these contexts is permissible because there is a court authorization for the examination or an opinion without examination. And this work is conducted within an evaluative framework including parameters for how and where the information may be used or disseminated. You see that? I do, yes. And, and this court authorized Dr. Spiegel to testify in this case, correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. I have nothing further. All right, redirect. Dr. Shaw, um, Mr. Nadelhoff just asked you about the court authorization of uh, Mr. Depp's evaluation. Are you aware that the court has twice denied Ms. Hurd's request for an evaluation of Mr. Depp? I heard that yesterday in, in testimony, yes. Okay, thank you, nothing further. All right, thank you, sir. You can either have a seat or, or you can leave, thank you. Your next witness.
state your name and address for the record. Jennifer Howell, Los Angeles, California. And what is your current occupation? I um, run the Art of Elysium, CEO of the Art of Elysium. Let me just go back. Now you've indicated that, that Whitney lived with you from January 2015. No. To, or, I'm sorry, May 2015 to April 2016. Are you absolutely certain about those dates? I am certain, yes. She came and went at different periods, but all of her stuff moved out of my house April 2016. And I'm sorry, did you say you were 100% certain of that? Ms. Hall, could you answer my question? Yes, she did go back to um, Amber and Johnny's at different points, but she was still living with me during that time. The question I asked because you were talking at the same time Ms. Vasquez was, was giving an objection was I believe that you said you were 100% certain of those dates. Is that correct? Same yeah. with me. All right. Oh, you previously testified that you were the CEO for Art of Elysium. Is that correct? That is correct. And are you still currently in that position? Yes, I am. And how long have you been the CEO for Art of Elysium? I am the founder of the organization. So um, we did our first workshop in August of 1997, filed the legal paperwork in February of 98 to set up a 501c3. So I guess since the beginning of the charity. Ms. Howell, when did you first meet Amber Heard? At the Pineapple Express premiere is where I met she and her sister, Whitney. Do you remember approximately what year that was? I believe it was around 2008. I'm sure that could be pulled. It was the LA premiere. I think there was probably multiple premieres, but it was the Los Angeles premiere of Pineapple Express. Was Ms. Heard there with Mr. Depp? No, this was long before. Um, I was a guest of James Franco and Amber was in the movie. And so I met she and her sister at the, I mean, to be specific at the after party of the premiere. Did Miss Enriquez end up working for Art of Elysium at some point? Yes, she did. What year did Miss Enriquez begin working with Art of Elysium? I believe it was in 2014. I don't have those documents right in front of me. Um, I believe it was leading into the year Amber was receiving the award. And what was Miss Enriquez's position at Art of Elysium? Art salon manager, director. Does Miss Enriquez still work for Art of Elysium? No. When did that end? Oh, 2015, I believe. Each time you saw Mr. Depp, did you ever see him doing any illicit illegal drugs? Never. Did you ever see him consuming excessive amounts of alcohol? Objection. Never. Did you ever see Mr. Depp appear intoxicated? No. Did Ms. Heard ever show you photographs of depicting injuries on her face or body? No. Did Ms. Heard ever tell you that Mr. Depp was abusive towards her? No. Mr. Depp paying your legal fees, Ms. Howell, for this deposition and the testimony you've provided in the UK action? He is not. Who is? Myself. Do you feel any particular sense of loyalty towards Mr. Depp? None at all. Do you feel any sense of loyalty towards Ms. Heard? None at all. Ms. Howell, do you recognize this check as the check that the Art of Elysium received on behalf of Ms. Heard 
for a donation, an anonymous donation of $250,000? Yes. Yes. I believe you testified previously that you understood that the anonymous donor was Elon Musk. Is that true? Yes. yes. If I could please have exhibit four brought up. And for the record, it's based stamp JH 22 through 29. Do you recognize this document, Ms. Howell? And if you need to scroll through the eight pages, feel free. Um, can you scroll down? Yeah, I recognize that. And what is this? That is an email, I believe, I sent to Whitney. Scrolling up to the first page of this attachment, who is Marcel? Pariso? Sure, Pariso. He, he is one of my oldest friends in Los Angeles who has served as a board member of the Art of Elysium and is one of my biggest confidants here in LA, kind of for the course of my career. And going down to the third page of this exhibit. Thank you. This is an email, Ms. Howell, that you sent to Whitney Henriquez on or about Tuesday, July 28th, 2020 at 11.20, excuse me, at 11.02 a.m.? It is. This is a true and accurate copy of an email exchange that you sent to Ms. Henriquez? Yes, I believe I'm the one who gave that. Yes, it is. And then did you forward email exchange and the attachments to Marcel Parasau? Yeah, I asked him to keep it for me. Why did you send this email and letter to Ms. Enriquez? Because I struggled very much with what to do in a situation that I love someone who I know is doing something very wrong and I know that they're doing it because they're trying to protect their sister and I'm trying to protect her and I'm just trying to get her to wake up and do the right thing, which is tell the truth. It's the only thing that can help everybody involved in this case. Ms. Howell, do you recall submitting a witness statement in the United Kingdom? Yeah, they basically just called to verify the witness statement that was submitted previously. And do you recognize this document to be the witness statement and the declaration that you submitted in the UK? And if you want to scroll down to look at it. Yes, I recognize it. And at the first page, do you see a date on this document? January 13th, 2021. And is this document a true and accurate copy of the declaration that you submitted in the UK proceeding on or about January 13th, 2021? Yes. And are all the statements in your UK declaration accurate and true? I mean, yes, I signed it, yes. All right, let's pull up what I believe was DEP Exhibit 9. 
It's been marked as Dep Exhibit 9. Exhibit 9. So, Ms. Howell, earlier you were shown this document. Um, scrolling to the end of it. Can you go? I don't, okay. There. Mm -hmm. Did Mr. Waldman assist you in drafting this email? Mm, absolutely not. Did you speak with Mr. Waldman at all about drafting this email? About writing an email? No, I did that on my own accord. Did you speak with Mr. Waldman at all about contacting the ACLU? I do not recall having a conversation with him about that. And Ms. Howell, you testified earlier that you received a check from Fidelity Charitable in January of 2018, is that correct? Um, I don't know if I said the date, but yes, I received an anonymous donation from that check that was submitted, whatever it's on there. I just don't know the date off the top of my head. And you testified that there was a letter sent along with that, um, that said that, uh, it was on in honor of Amber Heard. Yes. Richard, I was guaranteed 20 minutes with them after being attacked for three and a half hours by your side the last time. So I am gonna stick by what I was told before entering this and what your side agreed to. All right, your next witness. Uh, your Honor, Mr. Depp calls Candy Davidson Goldbron, who is the corporate designee of the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. All right, and that's by deposition, is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Hold on. Is it your understanding that you're here to testify today on behalf of the Children's Hospital? Correct. Yes. Okay. So as of June 2018, had any payments been made by Ms. Heard to the Children's Hospital um, in connection with the uh, $3.5 million pledge, aside from the original $100,000 check from Mr. White in August of 2016? Yes, there was a payment, um, a gift on January 9th, of 2018. And what amount is that gift that you're referring to? $250,000. Okay, and was that gift made by Ms. Heard or on Ms. Heard's behalf? By Ms. Heard. Okay, and, and what are you basing that statement on? By the um, check that we received from Fidelity. Char uh, Fidelity Charity that um, came to Children's Hospital. What is this document? It's a letter to Mr. White uh, from myself inquiring about further installment on the pledge um, that had not been fulfilled. And why did you write this to Mr. White on June 14th, 2019? I was trying to figure out if there were any other payments coming from Mr. White to fulfill the pledge because we had, because Children's Hospital Los Angeles had not received any other correspondence from him. And what is this document? It is a letter to Ms. Gottlieb uh, from myself on behalf of Children's, Los, uh, Children's Hospital Los Angeles inquiring about additional uh, gifts, pledge payment installments. This letter appears to be directed to Ms. Amber Heard, care of Jody Gottlieb. Is that correct? Correct. Um, who's Jody Gottlieb? In, in our, the Children's 
Hospital Los Angeles record. Um, Jody Gottlieb was our contact for Ms. Amber Heard. Uh, Ms. Goldbron, um, why did you send this uh, letter to Ms. Heard and Ms. Gottlieb? I was trying to see if the pledge was going to be fulfilled or not. In your experience, is it common practice for anonymous donors when making donations to in one paragraph state that they wish to remain anonymous and in the very next paragraph identify themselves? Yes. That is common? It is common for donors to want to remain anonymous publicly, but allow the charity to know who they are. Between June 2018 and the dates on which you sent the letters to um, Ms. Hurd and Mr. White in June of 2019, were any additional funds received from Ms. Hurd? No. Okay, so as of June 2018, a total of $250,000 had been received as, as far as the Children's Hospital is concerned from Ms. Hurd. And that was the same amount that was that had been donated a year later in June of 2019. Is that accurate? Correct. As of the date of this deposition, um, March 30th, 2021, how much in total has Ms. Heard donated to the Children's Hospital? For the, this particular guest? I mean, for the, in her lifetime? From 2016 to present? $250,000. Ms. Uh, Goldbrun, do you recall we were speaking about this letter uh, a few minutes ago? Correct. All right, and, and this was a letter that you sent to Ms. Hurd, correct? Correct. <clears throat> um, did you ever get a response to this letter? No. As of October of 2018, how much money um, had Ms. Heard directly donated to the Children's Hospital? $250,000. As of March 30th. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the end of that. Sorry, I, I just realized. You said October 2018? Correct. $250,000. Okay. As of March 30th, 2019, how much money <laughs> had Ms. Heard directly donated to Children's Hospital? $250,000. What is your understanding of the length of time over which Ms. Heard pledged the gift of $3.5 million to Children's Hospital? There was no date arrangement with Ms. Hurd to have this pledge paid off in a particular time. If Ms. Hurd uh, were to pay this, the, the rest of the 3.5 million uh, in two years or five years, would CA, the Children's Hospital welcome that? CHLA welcomes every and any donation that comes this way. Has Amber Heard's pledge of the $3.5 million to Children's Hospital expired, to your knowledge? Not that I'm aware of, no. It has not expired. All right, thank you. Your next witness, sir. Your Honor, I think we've concluded our witnesses for today. We will have more live witnesses tomorrow. Okay, all right. Ladies and gentlemen, that'll be the end of your day for today. Again, do not do any outside research. Do not discuss the case with anybody, and we'll see you tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., okay? Thank you. All right, you want to have a seat for just a moment because we do have a few proffers going to be done. Um, just, just for the record, we talked about it earlier. I will charge the 30 minutes extra time for today to the plaintiff's team.
so we can stay on time. I understood, Your Honor. Okay. All right. And I believe, Mr. Ronborn, you had some properties you wanted to do um, for testimony. Um, we did, for Your the, for the testimony record. testimony in a few exhibits. Mr. Nadelhoff is actually going to Okay, Mr. That. Nadelhoff, if you want to proffer testimony for the record as the testimony that the court has sustained objections. Here, Your Honor, it's, it's, gonna, it's a box here. So I just okay, wanna... That's fine. You can stay there as long as you stay close to the microphone. Yeah. I appreciate it. And, and Your Honor, um, what I was going to, what I will do is I'll explain what we're proffering the evidence for, and then we have copies. Um, Good. Which I'll provide to you. We can, I, I'll provide. We'll provide them to you electronically, or I, I don't have another copy for you right now, but I will okay. provi we'll provide. That's them fine. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Okay, um, uh, Your Honor, for Laurel Anderson on March thirty first, twenty twenty two, the defendant attempted to designate certain portions of the deposition testimony for trial. Of Dr. Laurel Anderson. A clinical psychologist who worked with Ms. Hurd and Mr. Depp. Dr. Anderson testified in, in the therapy session. Ms. Hurd reported to her that she was slapped by Mr. Depp, that he hit her in the head, had her hair pulled by Mr. Depp, kicked her in the leg, and that Mr. Depp gave Ms. Hurd bruises. Ms. Hurd also reported that Mr. Depp was the first to initiate any violence. Ms. Hurd also reported that she hid in a bathroom to protect herself from Mr. Depp. Ms. Hurd also reported to Dr. Anderson that Mr. Depp threw a phone at her on May 21st, 2016, hit her, and held her hair. Ms. Hurd also reported to Dr. Anderson that she was a victim of Ms. To, that she was a victim to Mr. Depp's abuse. The testimony is contained in Dr. Anderson's deposition transcript, which is Exhibit A. The court also excluded records of Dr. Anderson from Ms. Hurd's and Mr. Depp's therapy sessions and a treatment summary, which are Exhibits B and C. Mr. Depp objected to Dr. Anderson's testimony as described in medical records stating that they were hearsay and that they did not fall into any exceptions, including statements for purposes of medical treatment. The court sustained the objection on the ground that the testimony and exhibits were hearsay. For Dr. Kipper, on March 31st, 2022, the defendant attempted to designate certain portions of the deposition testimony for trial of Dr. David Kipper, Mr. Depp's physician. Dr. Kipper testified Ms. Hurd voiced concerns of Mr. Depp's behavior while on drugs and alcohol, that Mr. Depp tried to fight and push Ms. Hurd while he was attempting detox on his island, and that she found lots of cocaine in February 2016. Dr. Kipper also testified he told Mr. Depp to, quote, bury the dragon, which referred to the bad feelings that Mr. Depp has inside him. This testimony is contained in Dr. Depp Kipper's deposition transcript, which is Exhibit D. Dr. Kipper also testified about an email he wrote explaining Mr. Depp's detox treatment. In the email, Dr. Kipper wrote to Mr. Depp's sister that Mr. Depp had fundamental issues with anger, romanticized the drug culture, and had no patience if his needs were not met. This email is Exhibit C, Mr. Exhibit E. Mr. Depp objected to Dr. Kipper's testimony and the email stating it was hearsay, that it did not fall into any exceptions, including statements for purposes of medical treatment. The court sustained the objection on the ground that the testimony and exhibits were hearsay. Uh, Deborah Lloyd, on March 31st, 2022, the defendant attempted to designate certain portions of the deposition testimony for trial of Debbie Lloyd, Mr. Depp's nurse. Ms. Lloyd testified Ms. Heard voiced concerns about Mr. Depp's behavior while on drugs and alcohol and that Mr. Depp worked himself up into a rage and was trying to fight Ms. Heard while he was attempting detox on his island. This testimony is contained in Ms. Lloyd's deposition transcript, which, which is Exhibit F. Also, Ms. Lloyd kept nursing notes on these issues that she testified to, which is Exhibit G. Mr. Depp objected to Ms. Lloyd's testimony in portions of the nursing notes stating it was hearsay that did not fall into any exceptions, including statements for purposes of medical treatment. The court sustained the objection on the ground that the testimony in portions of the note, nursing notes were hearsay. Aaron Borum Falati. On March 31st and April 1st, 2022, the defendant attempted to designate certain portions of the deposition testimony for trial of Ms. Filati, Ms. Hurds, and Mr. Depp's nurse. Ms. Filati testified that Ms. Hurd reported to her on December 16th, 2015, that Mr. Depp headbutted Ms. Hurd in the forehead. This also was contained in Ms. Filati's nursing notes, which is Exhibit H. Ms. Filati further testified that Ms. Hurd reported being freaked out after the December 2015 incident and testified to text messages between herself and Ms. Hurd where Ms. Hurd reported the incident of abuse. These text messages are exhibits I, J, K, L, and M. Ms. Filati also testified on, that on May 21, 2016, 
Ms. Hurd reported that Mr. Depp became completely delusional and crazed and hit Ms. Hurd in the face while she was on the phone with I.O. Tillett Wright. Ms. Filati testified to text messages reporting this as well, which are contained in Exhibit N. The testimony is contained in Ms. Filati's deposition transcript, which is Exhibit O. Mr. Depp objected to Ms. Filati's testimony, portions of the nursing notes, and the text messages referenced stating it was hearsay that did not fall into any exceptions, including statements for purposes of medical treatment. The court sustained the objections on the grounds that the testimony and portions of the nursing notes and the text messages were hearsay. Amy Banks, Dr. Amy Banks, on April 29, 2022, the defendant attempted to designate certain portions of the deposition testimony for trial of Dr. Amy Banks, a clinical psychologist and relationship consultant who worked with Ms. Hurd and Mr. Depp. Dr. Banks testified that in therapy sessions, Ms. Hurd reported that Mr. Depp attacked her physically, including by hitting her with his hand. Mr. Dr. Banks also testified that Ms. Hurd reported that Mr. Depp cut his finger off and burned himself with a cigarette. Dr. Banks also reported that Ms. Hurd told her that Mr. Depp initiated the violence while in a session with Mr. Depp, and Mr. Depp did not object to the characterization of the violence. Finally, Dr. Banks testified that she believed Ms. Hurd's accounts of the violence and that Ms. Hurd was a victim of domestic abuse. This testimony is contained in Dr. Banks' deposition transcript, which is Exhibit P. Mr. Depp objected to Dr. Banks' testimony, stating it was hearsay that did not fall into any exceptions, including statements for purposes of medical treatment and for providing improper expert opinion. The court sustained the objections on the grounds that the testimony about the abuse was hearsay and that Dr. Banks' testimony that Ms. Hurd was a victim of domestic abuse was improper expert opinion. Connell Cowan, on April 29, 2022, the defendant attempted to, attempted to designate certain portions of the deposition testimony for trial of Dr. Connell Cowan, a clinical psychologist who worked with Ms. Hurd. Dr. Cowan testified that in the therapy session, Ms. Hurd reported abuse by Mr. Depp, including text messages and medical notes, where Ms. Hurd reported in December 2015 that, quote, Johnny did a number on me, end quote. This testimony is contained in Dr. Cowan's deposition transcript, which is Exhibit Q. It is also contained in Dr. Cowan's medical notes in Exhibit R at Depp 9122 through 23, and is contained in text messages that are Exhibits S and T. Mr. Depp objected to Dr. Cowan's testimony, stating it was hearsay that did not fall into any exceptions, including statements for purposes of medical treatment. The court sustained the objections on the ground that the testimony about the abuse was hearsay. Alan Blaustein. On April 29, 2022, the defendant attempted to designate certain portions of the deposition testimony for trial of Dr. Alan Blaustein, a clinical psychologist who worked with Mr. Depp. Dr. Blaustein testified that in the therapy sessions, Mr. Depp reported that he had cut himself as a child and burned himself with cigarettes. Dr. Blaustein also testified about the drugs that Mr. Depp was on, as reported to him by Ms. Lloyd. This testimony is contained in Dr. Blaustein's deposition transcript, which is Exhibit U. This information was also contained in emails, which are Exhibits V, W, and X. Mr. Depp objected to Dr. Blaustein's testimony regarding the cutting and burning himself as speculation, and the testimony regarding the drugs Mr. Depp was taking as hearsay that did not fall into any exceptions including statements for purposes of medical treatment. The court sustained the objections on these grounds. Bonnie Jacobs. On May 4th, 2022, the defendant attempted to introduce into evidence the treatment notes of Dr. Bonnie Jacobs, a clinical psychologist uh, who worked with Ms. Hurd. The treatment notes show Ms. Hurd reporting abuse by Mr. Depp, including sexual violence. The treatment notes are Exhibit Y. And based on the court's ruling, the uh, defendant did not call Bonnie Jacobs as a witness. Mr. Depp objected to Dr. Jacobs' notes as hearsay that did not fall into any exceptions, including statements for purposes of medical treatment. The court sustained the objections on those grounds. Um, I, have, I have some more. Give me a moment. As long as you don't just keep turning every page in that book. No, I'm, it I'm is not. I'm not staying for that. It is not. Okay. <laughs> The UK judgment. On April 29th, 2022, Ms. Hurd moved to allow evidence and questioning regarding the UK judgment and for admission of the judgment itself, which is Exhibit Z. 
In support for a motion, Ms. Hurd argued that Mr. Depp had opened the door to the admission of the judgment by presenting evidence of damages after the date of the judgment on November 2nd, 2020. For example, Ms. Hurd observed that Mr. Depp had sought damages for losing his role in Pirates of the Caribbean 6, a movie that had not yet been made. Ms. Hurd further observed that Mr. Depp testified that the op-ed had caused him and his family irreparable harm, there, thereby suggesting that his reputational harm had continued to the present. Ms. Hurd noted that Mr. Depp's expert designation indicated Michael Spindler relied on Mr. Depp's earnings from 2019 to 2021 when reaching his opinion, which resulted in an amendment to the designation. Ultimately, the court found that Mr. Depp had not opened the door to the admission of the UK judgment and overruled the motion, which the court did again today with Mr. Banya's opinions. Finally, Adam Berkovici, on May 19th, 2022, Ms. Hurd attempted to call Adam Berkovici, who was an expert in the policing and Los Angeles Police Department policing of domestic violence calls for service. Mr. Berkovici would have testified to his qualifications in the field of policing and LAPD policing of domestic violence calls for service as follows, and further outlined in Ms. Hurd's fourth supplemental and rebuttal disclosures dated March 31st, 2022. Mr. Berkovici spent 30 years with the LAPD, retiring in 2012 at the rank of lieutenant. He has extensive experience as a patrol officer, field supervisor, uniformed watch commander, both as sergeant second and lieutenant one, along with multiple assignments as an officer in charge, lieutenant second of specialized detective units. During his tenure with the LAPD, Mr. Berkovici held numerous positions directly responding to and overseeing subordinate officers' responses to the domestic violence calls for service, including as a patrol officer, supervisor, watch commander, and assistant watch commander. And actually this, Your Honor, is a, the person who prepared this prepared a longer brief of what he was going to say. I can, is it okay to submit it rather than hearing me read it all? Any objection to that? No objection. Okay. Okay. That's fine. And with that, that's proper. Okay. You just scared me with the size of that. No, I understand. Okay. All right. That's fine. If you can get Jamie our copy of it, we'll make sure it becomes part of the record as well. Okay. All right. Do you have any proffers, Mr. Chu, that you need to, at this point? Not at this time, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Then I think there's just a couple things I need from you. Like tomorrow, let me, by the end of the day tomorrow, if I could get clean jury instructions without the sites on them for the ones that have been admitted, and also the verdict forms as well, if that can work out. Okay. Your Honor, we sent revised jury instructions to them yesterday morning and a revised verdict form today. So just waiting to get back. Okay. Sure. We'll coordinate. All right. Thank you. And you're working with Jamie about some exhibits. There's some that were, both sides noted that were in evidence that are not. So I want to make sure everybody gets everything cleared up. You're caught up? Okay. Good. All right. Just keep that going so we can get that, make sure that's taken care of. As far as time left, Sammy, today, I can give you a rough estimate for two reasons. One, you had some depositions, so make sure you give the breakdowns to Sammy about those. And two, Sammy wasn't here today. He had a mandatory CLE that he had to do. So I just did a rough estimate, and I want to qualify that as a rough estimate. But it looks like the plaintiff has used about five hours today, and the defendant used about an hour and 15 minutes is what I have. Okay. And again, that's a rough estimate, so don't expect them to be the same. But Sammy's going to get to it this evening and send you an email this evening with the actual accurate times. Okay. Anything else? No, thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. No, Your Honor. Okay. Have a good evening. We'll see you in the morning. You too. Thank you. All rise.